All right, everybody, we have the first attendees starting to join us. So we will get started in two minutes. Fantastic. All right, good morning, everybody. So we have a good number of attendees already online. So I'm gonna go ahead and start this webinar. Uh, my name is Cynthia Newman. I'm CEO and owner of Crank Marketing Group, LLC. And this morning, I am super excited to welcome everyone to our second webinar in the Pivot to Excellence Executive Symposia and Summit Series. And this is Women Entrepreneurs and Executive Leadership. And I learned from Rosie that it is completely appropriate because today is International Women's Day. So uh, yay, girls. Um, our goal for this uh, webinar and series is to educate, inform, and connect the military and business community in a professional and educational forum. And at this particular time, I would like to introduce our two moderators. Uh, first, Ms. Susan De Villa, uh, who is currently serving as the first region president of the Association of the United States Army. She is also a partner at Ace Electronics, where she serves as vice president of sales and marketing. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Correct. All right. Ace Electronics is a contract manufacturer of custom assemblies and electronics. And over the last 20 years, she's been heavily involved with defense contracting and has led prime contracts valuing over $50 million. Her recent responsibilities include managing the company in new markets and growth areas for business. Correct? Right. And we will be assisted by Mr. Eric Lynn. Eric is currently serving as the president of the Suncoast chapter of the Association of the United States Army and is the past president for the European region. He has over 25 years experience in international business as a senior executive with General Motors and Coca-Cola, and he maintains a global network of professional contacts. Eric has been involved in federal government contracting since 2010 and specializes in the preparation of winning government proposals, supply program administration, management and quality control, HR solutions, OSHA compliance, and educational training in the government contracting process. So at this point, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Hey everybody, welcome. I'm the uh, chapter president of the Suncoast chapter of AUSA, as Cindy mentioned. I am uh, representing in our area, we have about 8,000 members, and hopefully a lot of them are viewing in today. And I asked Susan Davila to to co-moderate with us. She's the uh, first region president, and she has many thousands of tens of thousands of members in the northeastern states. So we're representing a big chunk of the country right now. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to give a, a shout out to a couple more people. Who, are, who should be joining us today. Number one, we have the third region president of Association of the U.S. Army, it's Bruce Fletcher. And the third region represents the Southeastern states, Panama and Puerto Rico. Uh, another person I'd like to mention is General Retired Robert Brown, who's the executive vice president of the Association of the U.S. Army. He's just joined us at our headquarters and uh, after Lieutenant General retired, uh, Pat McQuiston retired herself, then, then uh, General Brown joined us. So he may be on the call today. Uh, another shout out to all the ROTC and junior ROTC cadets and, and SAIs and PMSs who might be joining us out there in AUSA land. We love you, we support you, and uh, we're glad that you're joining us for our Women's History Month celebration. Uh, another shout out to the Army families and the veterans tuning in. We know that a lot of Army families and veterans, a lot of spouses are part of the business community. They choose to take the hard path of being entrepreneurs. So, uh, and lastly, our community partners who are joining us today. We couldn't do it without you. So what we decided to do for our Women's History Celebration this year is to share the stories of 
women entrepreneurs, executives, and veterans to tell their stories about how they did it. And their unique stories about their successes, their challenges, how they overcame it. So the, we have, we have uh, five panelists today. We've got Ingrid Centurion, Rosie Paulson, Cindy Newman, Kathleen Harris, and Maureen O'Brien. Each one has a different story to tell. Uh, amongst our speakers, amongst our panelists, we have, I believe, three, two to three published authors. We've got uh, several who are international business people who've being international business is one thing, but being an entrepreneur internationally is a full different ball game. And that we have several of those on here. So when we start, the number, first person we're gonna start with is up in Massachusetts, it's uh, Ingrid Centurion. So Ingrid, the very first time I met you, you, had, you were working for a company called Kinetic and uh, we were testing some robotic equipment at Fort Benning and you sent me a robotic controller from Kinetic uh, a backpack controller. Tell us your story about how you developed your career and became an entrepreneur. Sure. There's so for, the, for, for, for all those uh, people out there who are listening, and just so you know, right now, my dad's from Argentina and my mom's from Puerto Rico. So everyone's like, where are you from? You look this, you look that. So I was uh, born and raised in uh, Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, my dad died when I was two years old and my mom raised us, a Latina Puerto Rican woman who worked three, four jobs, very hard. And uh, she did a great job. I uh, ended up going to college, got an army ROTC scholarship. And that's how I got into the military. But just so you know, before that, I started flying airplanes when I was 16 years old. I saved $3,000 and my mom drove me to the airport. I didn't even have a driver's license. So for all those women out there uh, that want to be entrepreneurs, you're going to have to work hard. So make sure you are a hard worker and, and you never give up because not everyone can be an entrepreneur. Others just don't have it. And there's a lot of qualities and traits to be an entrepreneur. And one of those is you have to take the risk. It's real easy to go get a job and you have security, but being an entrepreneur is a different kind of person. And so as a pilot, as you know, I like to travel and I like to take risk. By the time I was 21, I had my commercial pilot license. I was ready to go work for the airlines, but I had to go into the military and I ended up doing 22 years on active duty. I flew Hueys, I was a test pilot, I was an instructor pilot, I flew Blackhawks, and then I transitioned into fixed wing aircraft. I got my top secret clearance and my job in Iraq was searching for terrorist groups within a, a military intelligence battalion, the 15th MI. We provided all the human intelligence, aerial intelligence, and imagery intelligence for the special operations guys on the ground. So after that 22 years, I retired and I moved to Massachusetts to work for the robot company that Eric was talking about, and that's Kinetic North America. That was my first job out of the military and Remember, being an aviator, I was always the only female. So for those women out there that are getting into entrepreneurship, whether you're in the finance field, whether you're in the transportation field, whatever field, most of the time, it's heavily male dominated. And the robotic world is heavily male dominated. And so we can talk all about those kind of things because I have a book coming out, which will inspire you. My book is called uh, Centurion's Commitment. And I share my life experiences and how I use that to uh, accomplish anything in life. And my book will be coming out in two weeks. So I wanted to share that, get that out there with you all. And then after I got laid off um, with Kinetic North America because of Obama and sequestration, I decided, what am I going to do? I'm going to start my own business. Everyone up here in Massachusetts is an entrepreneur. So there's great resources locally. And I started helping small businesses because I like to help people. I like to educate people. I want people to live their life to the fullest and accomplish more than they ever thought they could. I, I truly am a motivator um, of, of individuals. And so I, I think another big thing that you all need to learn is you have to network. 
you have to have the social skills to be able to walk into any room and work that room and get to know people and what, you know, what motivates them and, and where they're going in life. Because if you can help others, then maybe you'll get, you'll get some of that back. So I um, also am a business instructor for an organization called Veteran, the Veteran Entrepreneurial Training and Resource Network. Please write that down, V-E-T-R-N.org. Because we teach veterans and their family members how to scale their business. And this is a free program. You can apply, go to our website, www.veteran.org. It's a 13 week program. We're now taking students all around the country and we've been helping entrepreneurs go from generating, you know, $300,000 in revenue to a million. We've taken companies from 1 million to 5 million. And please apply. Uh, let Lee Goldberg know that I recommended you if you're listening. I'm also instruct an instructor in that program because like I said at the beginning, every small business owner works so hard and sometimes you're so engulfed in your business, you can't see what's going wrong from the outside. So this program allows you to actually look at that, really get deep into how to grow your business and as you grow, you need a plan and a strategy and you have to execute that strategy. And I, I know I only have two minutes, but I think those are the most important things I wanna share for right now. And once again, I also wanna share that my book is finally uh, coming out and it's uh, Centurion's Commitment. And please go ahead and order my book. And that will also help you with your personal goals and your business goals in life. Thank you, Ingrid. That is Outstanding. I love it. I didn't even know that you have been a commercial pilot before, before joining the Army. That is really fantastic. Um, our next panelist is a longtime friend of mine from decades past, and we've known each other for years. We grew up together, and she's a big, big executive at, at Bank of America. So I'm going to turn over the microphone to Maureen O'Brien, and she's going to tell us about her story. Warren. So thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. And um, I want to share, Ingrid, when you said that you were a commercial pilot, I laughed a little bit, <clears throat> not because I'm a pilot, but I am a skydiver. So every plane you have mentioned, I really want to jump out of. <laughs> <laughs> With that being said, you know, I think when, as Eric indicated, I think I'm the only person here who is not an entrepreneur. Um, as you indicated, I work for Bank of America. I'm a senior vice president for those guys right now. I currently run one of their customer service call centers, which is fun, right? But, you know, how did I get there? Um, obviously, I didn't start in banking. I actually apparently am severely dyslexic and I have a hard time adding. So the whole numbers thing has been a big shock and surprise for me, but it's been fun. But, I, you know, I think one of the things you guys will, you will find that it's going to be a very similar aspect of all of us as we talk today is our ability to take risks, you know, our, our willingness and desire, in fact, to take those risks. <clears throat> as I have made decisions along my career path, I, I asked myself a couple of questions. I asked myself one question, actually. If I do this, what could possibly go wrong, right? Well, I could go move to California and work for a company that goes bankrupt and bounces all their paychecks, and I got to surf on somebody's couch for a while. So I could be homeless. It stunk, but it didn't kill me, right? I could make a decision to move to Pennsylvania to work for another company that eventually in 2007, you know, gets out of third party origination, gets out of mortgages and they sell themselves to somebody else and I could be unemployed for six months. That really stunk, but it didn't kill me, right? I could make the decision that, hey, I really need a job. So I'm going to move back to Florida. And instead of running a national organization, which is what I did in Pittsburgh, I can run a mailroom. Well, that's going to stink. But I didn't stay there forever, you know? So, and each one of those questions, each time I ask myself that question, what could happen? Nothing that's going to kill me, you know? So when I made the decision <clears throat> and... I didn't mention, but I, I, I'm a 22 year veteran in mortgages, right? I, I did mortgages for 22 years. It's an industry that I really loved. 
uh, that I had a lot of passion for. But of course, the companies that went out of business, went bankrupt, et cetera, those, those were all mortgage companies. So when I moved to Florida, I came working for, uh, for Bank of America, for Countrywide actually initially, as they were getting purchased by Bank of America, running that mailroom. And Bank of America eventually got out of the type of mortgage business that I did. They, they went to focus more on mortgages that were originated by their, in their own branches by their own people. What I did was securitization. So it got out of that piece of the business. And I had to start thinking, I'm like, well, I do learn, right? I know things won't kill me. I know it won't kill me to be homeless, but I don't want to do it again, right? I know it won't kill me to be unemployed, but I don't want to do that again either. So as I was looking at how the bank was, was reacting to the, the whole mortgage thing, I was like, you know, I got to get out of this. I need to do something different. Um, so I looked and I looked at where we were from a consumer banking perspective. Now understand, I loved mortgages, right? And of all my decisions that I made, the decision to get out of that type of industry and into something different was the most emotionally fraught for me. I couldn't just ask my questions, what's the worst that could happen? I had to ask the question too, emotionally, what's the worst that could happen? But as I looked and I looked and I, and, and I finally did make the decision to move into the consumer bank and I'm asking my questions, what's the worst that could happen? Okay, probably not gonna be homeless again, right? Probably not gonna be unemployed again. Um, and moving into the consumer bank, I went to work for them with their deceased unit. We were building a whole new unit with, within the organization. So, you know, we have clients that eventually pass away. And those issues, those accounts were dealt with individually at the, at the various branches. Well, although in any given day, a large number of people might pass away in the United States, in any given branch, they might have one person come in to notify us of a deceased individual maybe once every six months. It didn't build the kind of expertise they needed. So they were looking for somebody to build that out. Now, I will share with you that I, although I had bank accounts, <laughs> I had a savings account and a checking account, I didn't understand how that stuff worked. So moving into that organization, having to learn all of that, as well as all of the contractual requirements for, for wills, for estates, for all of that stuff, was certainly a little concerning. But again, as I asked my questions, gonna keep a job because people are gonna keep dying right? Not going, you know, the only really bad risk there was I might discover that I am not as smart as I think I am. I think I could live with that. So I went and I took that position and it was fabulous. You know, I, I earned my senior vice president with the bank as I helped build out that organization. You know, I, I, I built the people and the processes. I was able to create a level of expertise within the whole organization that they hadn't had before. And I, I had the opportunity to, you know, I had my office in Tampa, I had an office in California, did a lot of traveling, it was fantastic. And then, you know, you get to that point where you built it and it's done, and now it's time for somebody else to have a chance to do something with it, right? So I'd kind of gotten there and I'm, I'm thinking, what am I gonna do next? Where are we gonna go from here, right? So they came to me and they asked me, hey, we have this call center in Tampa. What do you feel about running a call center? And I'm all like, ooh. Call center. Ooh, people calling in. I don't know. I've never done that before. I, I hmm, what could possibly go wrong? Right? Not going to be homeless. Probably not going to be unemployed. I already found out I'm not as smart as I thought I was. So I can live with that. <laughs> so I, I went and I took that organization as well. And, and I'll tell you, it was hard, right? Because it wasn't just learning about bank accounts, because I knew all about that, but it was learning how to interact with an entire call center. So not just the clients that are calling in, but those individuals that, that work in call centers that are good on the phone, that are good with clients. And, and it, 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 it was certainly a huge learning experience, but I was able to develop from there a team that I have huge amounts of respect for. You know, the people that I work with are amazing. They have taught me so much about human nature, about interacting with people. And I always thought I was good. You know, I'm kind of a people person. Um, but I had no idea that I was nowhere near as good as I thought I was. Not just not as smart as I thought I was, but not as good as I thought I was until I took this, this role. And it's given me the, the opportunity and the exposure with the rest of the organization that I hadn't had before. So now as I look for next roles and I start to think, well, you know, I'd like to go do project work or, or I'd like to go help the bank 
build something else, make something else better, something else fun. And as I think about what could possibly go wrong, I'm like, well, I already know, I'm not gonna be homeless, not gonna be unemployed. I know I'm not as smart as I thought I was. And I know I'm not as good as I thought I was, but I'm better than I was when I started. So I, you know, I just, I wanted to kind of share that with you guys as far as a really fun, um, but true expression of, of who I think all of us here are. You know, again, just because I'm not a, a, an entrepreneur, we still have that same or similar drive to, to learn more, to take those risks, to take those chances, to, to make ourselves better and to make our organizations, whether it's the one that we own ourselves or one that we participate in, the best that it can be. And I, I think I was very short, perhaps. <laughs> but I'll turn it back to you, Eric. Yeah, to unmute myself. Maureen says she's not as smart as she thought she was. I, I was on a debate team with her years ago, and I can tell you that she's she's very smart. So okay, Eric, Eric next panelist who's going to speak is Hi. Rosie Paulson. And when we did our introduction, I neglected to say that we're broadcasting today from her office, Rosie Paulson Enterprises in Town and Country, which is part of Tampa. And I'm going to turn over the microphone to Rosie right now. And she's going to tell us about what she's doing. Rosie? All right. Let's see. Can you hear me? All right. Awesome. So welcome. Bienvenidos to Rosie Paulson Enterprises Business Center. I am so thrilled and excited to have all of you guys here today. Um, I'm originally from Ecuador, and I came to this amazing country in 1988 at 10 years old. Uh, when in my country, girls couldn't play soccer, I had to battle my way into the field because I was really a good goalkeeper. But see, girls didn't play soccer and goalkeeping was a very coveted uh, position. But because I came from a basketball background, I was good at it. So one day, I was about 10, like I mentioned, and I went to the field ready for battle and to work my way and to work in the team. And then I found all my friends playing with this girl. And I was surprised because I'm saying, what is the difference between this girl and me? Then I saw she was blonde and she was white and she had green eyes. And I said, what is different from her? Am I friends, which they were all boys, and they had no problem playing with her. See, she's an American, and Americans can do whatever they want. So I befriended the girl with my broken English and realized that she was a missionary from the United States. So once I find out that she was in our country to share the gospel with Ecuador, I run to my house and I tell my mom, I know exactly how I'm going to play soccer. We're gonna to move to the United States and I'm gonna meet this guy named Jesus and everything is gonna work out, mom. That is when I put my eyes and realized that I could come to this country, this amazing country where I can be anything that I can be. At 12 years old, I visit uh, America for the first time. Uh, I studied in Miami and then moved to uh, uh, visit New York City. And in New York City, I was able to learn my English within like three days and the subway system, because that's very important. If you learn the so subway system, you know where to go. And I became, I knew in my heart at that time that I was in the right place where I belong. I was just an American born in the wrong place. <laughs> so for the next five years, when I came back from Ecuador, I, put myself the idea that I was moving to the United States. And in 1988, my sister and I walk into this amazing country and I have not left ever since. I went to visit Ecuador a couple of times, but I can tell you that the whole idea of becoming an entrepreneur was not something that I ever even thought about because both of my parents are teachers um, and they had a nine to five job. And as a matter of fact, for them, an entrepreneur was a taboo because they did not understand that you can make money but not have a paycheck every week. So that was something new for me. Um, 
but life happened. I got married. I had two kids, and um, I wasn't I wasn't happy. Um, and that also reflected in my daughter. And at that time, she started giving me a lot of trouble. And I left my ten uh, um, job career, my ten year career, to be a mom because she needed me so bad. So when I came back into the work field, I stayed um, with her for about a year. When I came back to the work field, I remember at that time, um, I, I gave myself to the Lord. I did find the Lord at that time. I was about 33 years old. And I asked him, the first thing I said is, will you please give, uh, make me the godly woman you want me to be? I did not know that that had to be with my business. And at that time, because I was looking for a new job, I really made a list of what I wanted. And I said, I want to be able to talk about you and what you have done in my life. I want to be able to, to, to practice my Spanish because I wasn't speaking Spanish at that time. I want to be able to help people. If I can just help people, please. And whatever you do, God, please don't make me a salesperson. Well, three out, of, three out of the four things I requested were granted because I went to work with this company called uh, Humana Healthcare with um, the Medicaid Advantage field or the Medicare world. And uh, I had never owned a policy in my life. I had never sold anything in my life, but I realized that I was a natural at helping people. And then when you go in there to just help out, Money comes, but that's not the reason why you do things. If your pure motives is to really help and make an impact on your community and make a change, things will come the way um, easier. And, and I started helping ever since then. And my business just grew and grew and grew. And now I decided that perhaps working for a corporation uh, was not the best option for my clients because my at the end my loyalty was always to the client so I decided to go out on my own and start an entrepreneur business in 2009 then I built that one company um, uh, learn a lot build a second company which I call it like the the daughter company and that diversified had more agents so we got to about 10 agents and two of those agents decided to buy the second company with at that time I had a partner with. And that company today is employing five, pay, uh, five full-time employees and 10 independent agents. So that one company. And then people kept asking me again, Rosie, you are so successful. Can you teach me how to be successful in this country with my business? So then in 2020, I wrote my book, Nieke, The Spirit of a Resilient Mindset. And Nieke is a Quechua word that means grit and resilient. And that is really what an entrepreneur is all about. Because, you know, we win battles daily the moment that you get up and do it again. And sometimes you might not see where that next paycheck comes from, right? But you get up and do it again because there's no other option. And that's your nieke and your grit. Everyone has it. You just do not know it's there until you work in it. It's like when you walk and you haven't walked in a while and then the following day you have that muscle that you never know it was there. That's your nieke. So I now teach people how to, uh, to, how to find their grit, how to be persistent, and how to, thrive, achieve, uh, how to achieve a thriving, successful, and profitable business. So I am excited. Today is International Women Day, and I'm wearing my Wonder Woman outfit because I want you to remember you are a hero, and we need you. Don't give up. Entrepreneurs rock. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Rosie. That was so fantastic. It's a very exciting story. And uh, we've, we've known each other for, I think, three years now yeah. or so. And, and Rosie is just a ball of fire. She is all over the Tampa, Tampa and Florida business community. And what she didn't mention, I don't think, is she is a point, she's a commissioner for the Florida, Florida Commission on the Status of Women. So she's, 
she left that little point out because she had so many cool things to talk about. But but uh, that's that's an interesting point. So it's Women's History Month, so that's that's another point. So um, our next speaker is calling in from the UK. She's a scientist. She's been a corporate executive, and for the past seven or eight years, she's been an entrepreneur. So Kathleen, I'm going to hand you the microphone. Are you are you ready to go? Yep, let's go. Kathleen? Yes. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? I think you need to unmute. We can hear you. We can hear her. Got it. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Eric. Um, I'm just going to say, I think Maureen got a little bit of a better introduction than I did. And full disclosure, Maureen's my sister. So I'm saying there could have been a little bit more, like we were from the same neighborhood. <laughs> So, um, well, so my name is Kathleen Harris and I do live in the UK. I moved to the United Kingdom 18 years ago. I moved here with my husband um, because we were a lot younger than we are now. And why not? What did we have to lose? What did we, um, he, we certainly had jobs to go into or else they wouldn't have let us stay in the country, but it was a three year uh, gig. We were just having a three year work visa and just to try to experiment and try to see what happens in the world when you live in it. It's very different to live somewhere than it is to take a vacation somewhere. Uh, and I think, you know, that sort of highlights one of the really recurring themes that you're going to hear, I think from every speaker, is that you have to have a risk taker. There's nothing wrong if you're not a risk taker, but then probably being an entrepreneur isn't actually quite for you. So, you know, it's just this idea of, like what Maureen said, what do you have to lose? How bad is it going to be? And I mean, there could be times we say, I don't want to <laughs> take that risk right now, but how bad is it going to be? And that is one of the, the, the tenets that I've always had when I started my business. Um, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always wanted to be able to run my own business. But I think one of the things that's really important uh, for entrepreneurs, and there's all different types of, of um, segments in the marketplace. My segment is uh, regulatory consulting. We do global strategic regulatory uh, partnerships with a pharmaceutical uh, and life science industry, which is medical devices, in vitro diagnostics, and biologics. We do a lot of mergers and acquisitions. We do a lot of work with remedial action. And this is a field that I have been in for 30 years. So it's the time is starting to get up there. Um, and I did start my business seven years ago. And certainly over the course of when I first moved to the UK 18 years ago, I wanted to start my own business. I said, okay, I can do this. But then I had to really look around and say, well, actually, this is a completely different cultural market. Maybe I should understand it a little bit more. Maybe I should learn some things. I think one of the things that uh, with an entrepreneur, you have got to have so much ability to take risk and believe in yourself. But I think you also have to be humble. And you also have to say, is there opportunities for me to learn something else? Am I I, not so much am I ready out of fear because you have to be willing to take risks, but you have to have this dome of truth. I always call it the dome of truth for yourself. Why are you doing it at this moment? Is it because nothing else is available to you and so you're just going to take it? That's not the right reason to want to be an entrepreneur. You want to be an entrepreneur because you have something to offer that nobody else has to offer. And you know that you can offer it. You know that you have the ability, the skill, the mindset, the courage to offer it. Just the lack of any other option isn't the same thing. And I'm not saying that you can't start your own business with that kind of, um, I have nothing else to do kind of mindset, but I mean like having a sustainable growing entrepreneurial relationship with your business and then with your clients is you really have to have that dome of truth and that humility to say, do I, am I ready to offer this to people? What am I offering this to people? Um, for me, I was offering them and my company uh, regulatory consulting and strategy. So these are companies uh, that are very large multinational corporations that are coming to us and saying, okay, we want to acquire this asset. So you need, would you please go and take a look at it and tell us if it is worth $11 billion. They're believing in us. I have to have the skill set and my team has to have the skill set that we can actually offer them something or else you're not going to grow your, grow your business. You only have to mess up a few of those <laughs> with a, the lack of skill set before it becomes quite obvious that possibly you're not um, offering what you're advertising. I think that's something that's incredibly truthful for any entrepreneur. You have got to absolutely offer what you advertise. 
And hopefully if you're an entrepreneur, you really believe in yourself and you are the best. You are the absolute best of what you're offering, but please make sure that you are. Please make sure that you're meeting your user needs and requirements and you're exceeding your user needs and requirements. So these are things that I've, I, I had to figure out over the course of, um, of living here, doing my math really quickly, of living here for 13 years and then saying, okay, I want to start my business. I think that I understand the, the world sufficiently. You're always learning, but I think that I have something to offer. Certainly when my last organization that I worked for before I started this business, this is the type of work I did. And I saw that there was a whole gap in the marketplace. Certainly multinationals hire uh, due diligence teams and you hire consultants and then you hire people that are gonna help you with uh, your strategy in terms of if I'm gonna spend 20 million developing a, a pharmaceutical, I have to have a regulatory strategy to figure out how am I going to get my money back and how am I going to place it into the marketplace? And you certainly always end up getting external support. And I would sit in these in, with my company and I would sit with businesses and nobody was actually exceeding my user needs. And I'm thinking, why am I listening to these people? Why do not, why I can see what the user need is and I can see how they're not meeting it. And I think I have enough, enough for this market and enough knowledge and enough experience. And I think I could offer something fantastic. And it took me about a year to create the courage, I'll be very honest. I've always been a risk taker, but it took me about a year to create the courage because I was senior vice president of a huge multinational uh, company. Did I wanna leave that? Did I wanna walk away from that? And then it comes back to what Maureen was saying is what's the worst that's gonna happen? And I remember having this conversation with my family because you know, it's certainly that was a big change for them um, saying, what's the worst that's gonna happen? It's not like I'm a distance runner and I'm cutting off my leg. I'm just exiting corporate America to create international uh, corporate, I am American, America. So, you know, I was, I was like, what's the worst that's gonna happen? And I think that gave me that, that ability to take that risk on and say, what is the worst? Nobody's gonna be able to take away my 23 years of experience in this field. So if this totally doesn't work, humility, what I said, be humble, say this isn't quite working, analyze why it didn't work, see if you can fix it. And if you, for whatever reasons you can't at that point, you can always go back into something else. There was always gonna be something else available. And I think as long as you have that, and it might not be to the same level. I mean, it took me years to get to a senior vice president level in this field, but I would have something. So I think that ability to have the, the lack of fear to be able to assess risk and then to certainly know what you're offering. And I think that's why it, took me about a year to write my business plan. That is so important. You don't just go off the cuff. You really have to write things down. Well, for me, I have to write it down, think it through. I came up with my business plan and then I realized I could make this happen. And then of course you have to be willing to work through and work with people, reach out for, it certainly goes back to reaching out with organizations, reaching out if you don't have the business background, reach out to organizations like this training, um, that Ingrid, I believe you were saying like your, your, your group is doing, reach out because there's always gonna be things you don't know. It doesn't matter how big my budget was with my other companies or how many things I had to touch. I didn't have to do it all. And as an entrepreneur in the very beginning, it was just me and I had to do it all. I had to figure out cash flow. I had to figure out that number at the end of the year doesn't mean anything because maybe you got all your cash flow in the last quarter and you didn't get anything in the second quarter. Those were things I did not know. <laughs> those, were, those were not aspects that I understood. But certainly over in Europe, we have a um, chamber of commerce that offers a lot of these types of, of, of insights that can help you. So certainly it was tapping in and not being arrogant, being humble, tapping into the resources that were out there that were gonna help me be successful. So I started out seven years ago with Kathleen and uh, now I have seven people, full-time employees that work for me. Uh, one in Japan, one in China, and the other ones are in the UK. So it, it certainly is this wonderful thing of, I, I did this because I wanted to build and I wanted to create something. And I actually wanted to meet a need and to help people. And I love the fact that I work with companies now for the last seven years. And so, you know, building those relationships, I think are really, really wonderful and fun and important, but it's so important as an entrepreneur that you have your dome of truth you know why you're doing it and, and what you can offer and you just have to be brave. That's it, my 10 minutes.
Kathleen is one of the most amazing salespeople I've ever met because when I talked with her a long time ago, baby, <laughs> to start her business, she says, Hey, I quit my job and start my own business. And I said, when do you think that you'll get some, uh, some clients? And she said, Oh, my, my old employer hired me immediately as a, as a supplier for, for their services. <laughs> it was amazing. It was epic. Thank you, Kathleen. It worked out. Thank you. Our next panelist is our very own Cindy Newman. She's vice president of marketing communications for our chapter. And, but she has been, had an amazing business career in, in Europe, uh, ranging from, from corporate to being, being an artist and coming back to the States and starting up a couple of businesses. I'm going to turn over the microphone to you, Cindy. So here, here's your microphone. All right. Thank you. Um, it's been super interesting and inspiring to listen to everybody's stories. And it's, it's funny because I, I do find a, a common thread in, um, you know, being brave. And I, I do know that of our age group, probably all of you guys watch The Highlander with Christopher Lambert. And if you can remember that scene where he always, you know, oh, there can only be one. Um, I always felt like that scene was fraught with you know, you know that you want to proceed to the next level, but you also know it's going to hurt to get there. And um, I felt like that many times in my life. So I was born in a super small town. So here from Mr. Terrence, I am from Fairfax, South Carolina, which is in Allendale County. And that is a one stoplight rural town where there's like literally nothing to do. And, you know, I guess what I've always said is being a you know, entrepreneurial mind and bohemian spirit that, um, you know, I set into action a chain of events that did actually give me the opportunity to see the world. So I'm kind of like Rosie's story inside out. I started, you know, in the middle of nowhere and absolutely could not wait to get out and see the whole world. Um, and that, that dream, you know, it, it was really um, facilitated by taking those steps and taking those risks. So it began, you know, going to Salem Academy to boarding school, leaving my small town and, and what I was comfortable with. Um, I learned French, I learned Latin, I learned German. Um, and the cool part was each step leads to the next. So when I was in boarding school, we had these Jan term internships and I got to work with a TV talent agency in New York and a TV talent agency in Tampa, Ms. Dot Burns. That was an incredible experience living with Dot. Um, then I went on to graduate from there, went to College of Charleston and did my junior year abroad. Um, you know, and I wanted to really kind of study music. And my dad was like, absolutely not. You will learn to support yourself. And so what I found is that language is very similar. And I think being musical is, it helps you learn languages. So I figured out what am I gonna do with this language stuff? So that's when I start, when I added the business aspect to it. And that goes back to grad school with Eric. Eric and I have known each other, I think about 30 years, which is terrifying, but true. <laughs> and so we, um, I, we were both in the German track at USC at Darla Moore's uh, International School of Business. And that opened really cool doors, which included leaving home and sitting there in the airplane and your parents really don't want you to leave and taking off and heading for Europe. You know, it's a, it's a big deal and you gotta have the guts to do it. And I think, you know, as a, as a young woman, it's important to realize that you're gonna have opportunities right now that might be big and scary and, and difficult to imagine, but if you don't take them right now, it's going to be so much harder the older you get. And that's not bad. It's just different. You know, when, you, it's, it, when you're single and you can follow your dreams and there's, there's no kids you got to watch after or a husband's job you have to take into consideration, it's easier to make, take those risks and jumps. It doesn't mean you can't do it later. It's just be brave when you're young because it will behoove you, you know, later in life. Um, so I guess the, the cool part of my internship is I was the, I was the student who got the, the coolest internship at NIBS. I got to work at Porsche. 
So um, we had the you know luxury brand, and we were in Ludwigsburg, so that's a little bit north of Stuttgart, Germany. And uh, at that time, they were launching the Porsche 968, which was kind of a cool beefed up version of the 944. And then the, the egg, uh, I wasn't real into it. It was kind of an older car for older people, but it was the Porsche 928 S4. And uh, so I was responsible for, you know, promote working on promotional materials, interfacing the advertising agency. And it was funny because Porsche's still a German company. And so when you brought that American spirit in there, they're like, where do you get all this energy? And I'm like, I love what I do. <laughs> so um, that was our internship. And after that, you know, I, I was like, well, gosh, I, I really want to stay in Europe. I, I, I love this. This is where I wanted to be. It's what I wanted to do. So um, I landed a job, you know, after we finished school where I would, and this is, okay, this is cool. So my Mother's family is basically a bunch of bunch of Bohemians. I mentioned that. So we have our, you know, our Czechoslovakian horse thieves. And I had always wanted to go to Eastern Europe. So when I started applying for jobs, I really landed my dream job working for um, a in Germany for Rhone Polenk Rohr, which was basically um, a French owned pharmaceutical company. And my job was helping set up operations in Eastern Europe. And that gave me the opportunity to travel to all of those Eastern European countries. Um, we got, we set up subsidiaries in Warsaw and Prague and Budapest. And I spent my 25th birthday in Moscow and I thought that was the bomb in uh, Bratislava, Budapest. And so by the time I was done, I had worked myself out of a job. And that was because we finished setting up the subsidiaries and I did not set the timer I meant to, so let me know. Um, I guess at this point, I would say, as cool as all this sounds, as a woman, you are always, at some point in your career, going to be hit with someone who tells you you cannot do what you want to do just because you're a woman. And, uh, or even better, that you're going to get your opportunity if you earn it in a less professional manner. And I'll tell you that hashtag me too hasn't changed a thing about human nature, but it's not a matter of if you'll be challenged, it's how you meet that challenge that will make all the difference. That you look back on yourself and you're like, you know what, I didn't cave, I didn't compromise, I stayed true to myself, and the next opportunity will come. You don't have to give into that. So believe in yourselves. Um, and I guess that came before my unsuccessful bid to uh, move into the Eastern European management team in Paris. And I was certain I was going for that job. I spoke French, I was successful, but that just wasn't meant to work out. And I did a stint in the, uh, I guess, over the counter uh, industry for domestic Germany and was bored to tears. And so it was time for that next challenge. Um, so that leads to a very big jump in careers. And I met my future husband, who is already a very famous and successful songwriter and guitar player in Germany. And one thing I learned is how to recognize people who can be successful, people who know how to work. I swear to God, I've never met somebody who works so much as my husband. <laughs> but uh, so I knew I'd met this team that I could work with. And sure enough, you know, we began writing songs and producing music. And I did what my dad told me not to. And uh, we landed a record deal with Virgin UK and that was awesome. But the greatest success we had was writing for one of the most successful German language artists of all time. And it's, it's a real thrill when you're sitting in the stadium and 60,000 people are singing your song that you wrote at your kitchen table. And that's, that's pretty neat. And then that artist retired. So we're gonna go back to resilience and flexibility and thinking, okay, where am I? And what do I wanna do next? And by that time, you know, my children were super young. I had been in the United States for 13 years and that was also a transitional moment. Now I've been in Germany for 13 years, excuse me. Um, because I realized that I could move my children without super huge repercussions in school and changes, et cetera. So we came back to the United States in 2006 and being the entrepreneurial spirits we are, you know, kind of reinvented. And we uh, built on my husband's career, basically continuing to serve the existing music clients, but building out international photography and filmmaking business. And then I chose, because that was the time, 2006, the beginning of search engine optimization, the internet marketing, 
and it all went click in my mind. I was like, I get this. This is what I've done my entire life. So um, now with my marketing background and an excellent staff and 15 years of hard work, um, I manage a website development internet marketing firm. And, you know, we are poised to take the next step. We have, um, you know, worked with AUSA now for five years and recently been asked to serve as the communications director for the uh, Patent Foundation. So I'm very excited about that new role. We'll see where that takes us. And another thing that we've done recently is kind of do a SWOT analysis. Where are we? What are our, what's the capacity? Where are our strengths and weaknesses? And we found there's a super opportunity in our you know, international connections and relationships. And that's what led me to go and work to obtain our HubZone certification and our you know, women's own small business and economically disadvantaged women's own small business. So I hope and expect that we're gonna be able to successfully market um, a wide range of materials, industrial equipment, medical supplies and services to the federal government using these small business set-asides. And um, I truly believe you make your own destiny. You know, you, you get out of this life what you put into it. And over the last 30 years, that's what I've done. Just redefine myself and try to become that next step of who I want to be. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. That, that is so fun. It's such so interesting to hear all of all of everybody's stories. Um, what we do now is we have a few minutes of time, and I'm going to open up questions to the panelists. So anybody who's attending, including the other panelists, you can ask questions of the panelists, and and like we can ask Maureen why she chose to jump out of an airplane 985 <laughs> times when it was a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> Okay. Well, no, I was just chuckling because I here I thought. Let's see here. We have attendee and allowed to talk. So we have a question from Jeannie. Jean. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, excellent panel, and thank you to everyone. I'm retired uh, Army, and I really enjoyed this. I um, was curious. You know, the, the personnel management aspect of any business is so time-consuming, and the sensitivities are so high. And I'm, I was wondering if you feel extra pressure as a female leader of any, any of the size businesses you're describing in uh, making sure that uh, employees are protected from harassment, sexual harassment, all, all the things that unfortunately are still out there uh, in society, how you've um, maybe managed expectations uh and dealt dealt with this uh through how, how you've set up your companies and, and that's for anyone to answer thank you takers i'll i'll take a quick one at that if that's okay mm -hmm. can you hear me yes okay so one of the things, so I live in uh, England and I have employees though that are on a completely different continent. So I have a, a gentleman that's in uh, Japan and I have a, a gentleman that's in China and then the rest of my, my staff is in the UK with very, very different cultural expectations, very different um, employment laws. And one of the things that I really, because there are no men in my field I've never had to wait in line in a bathroom. <laughs> like there's never, you know, any corporate meeting. I'm like, okay, see you guys in just a two seconds. There's never a line, there's nothing. So, and so I have dealt with this and you do learn how to deal directly, negotiate in terms of leave me alone. And, you know, there's all these things. And I've, I always swore when I started my own business that that was never going to be the, I did not want that to be the case. And I had to develop a culture that got rid of that. And so one of the things I did as part of my, my plan when I started this is I actually did hire a consultant to help me with my human resource. I think the idea that human resource can be a secondary thing isn't correct. You've really got to outline your policies, what your expectations are, and then also understand how you're going to lead that. Because I, I, I love my teams. They're wonderful, but we're not necessarily each other's friends. There is a culture that you have to have that is creative, interactive, wonderful, but I have a certain 
standard that I would expect from everybody and a certain standard that I expect everybody to treat themselves with and for me to treat them with. And that really helped me to articulate that by working with HR people, put policies and procedures in place so that I, I onboarded people. That was something that was really difficult because we're such a small business. It's so easy to think, oh, you know, that's just Kathleen or that's just Andy or that's just, you know, a chin. And that, you know, and, and I wanted to make sure that there was this respect of my vision for my corporate culture. And I think that probably, and, and I hope, my understanding, it seems like it's working, but I'm so glad I had to do that because I did have a few instances where I had to say, oh, wait a minute, that's not okay. That, that kind of joke isn't okay. That kind of inference isn't okay. And if I didn't have those policies and procedures in place that I could point to and say, we've gone through this and now we're dealing with this from an HR standpoint, I wouldn't have been able to deal with it. It would have affected my corporate culture because I didn't have one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I, I, want, I want to add to that as far as, you know, HR, there are HR people out there who, aren't, who are not HR professionals. Uh, they have no uh, skills when it comes to people. Uh, they're sitting in a job and it, it's not the HR's responsibility to set this culture and standard for your company as an entrepreneur. Uh, I go back to, you know, being in the military and I learned so much from being in the military and it's about your leadership philosophy. And as a female working in a man's career my whole life, even getting out, you as the, as the CEO of the company have to set the standard on, on, and it all comes down to respect. You have to respect people and individuals and when they're in the workspace and whether it's a male or female and they disrespect uh, and they start joking wh whether it's about women's body parts or men's body parts that is unacceptable behavior so i would say that there's you know the standards like um she was saying as well as cussing and swearing I, I come from a background of working with law enforcement. I work with the sheriff's department. I work with the FBI. I work with the firefighters. Those are all different cultures. And they love, they, they're swearing, 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 swearing. And hey, yeah, women swear too. But if you as a leader, you choose to not use that kind of language, then everyone else needs to understand that and, and, and follow the standards of you as a leader. You know, they're going to have to change their behavior. And I know it's really hard, but um, this is something that, you know, swearing, this all leads down a certain path of behavior, as well as being in AUSA or being in the VFW or being in this nonprofit. Every age of individuals that we work with, they all come from a different generation and they behave a certain way. So it's all about you and what you're willing to put up with. So people say, oh, you know, I recently you know, got involved in, in running for politics and someone said, why would you ever want to do that? They're going to ruin your reputation. They're going to do this. You're crazy. And I said, no, I felt like I needed to do it because I felt like it was my duty with all our freedoms being taken away. And so the only person that can ruin my reputation is me. And so as you run your businesses, you make, so, you make sure that you stand strong on this because some of you will waver. And I know a lot of women who are in these fields of the financial industry, the legal industry, and the men are so disrespectful and they're disrespectful who, who, who they know they can get away with it. And so people always ask me, oh, Ingrid, you were in the military. Weren't you harassed? Weren't you this? Weren't you that? And you know what? I, I, I wasn't because it's up to you ladies. It's up to you to, to take it and put up with it. Rosie, can you tell us about the, the uh, commission where you're, you're the commissioner over the state of Florida? Yes, thank you for that. Awesome. So the one of the things that I, I share with people is that I am a person that if I find a um, avenue to make a change, um, I go for it. 
Um, so about uh, five years ago, I will say, um, I, I started to dive into politics. Remember coming from another country, politics was kind of like a taboo, but I realized that politics affects your business directly or indirectly. So one, of, uh, one day I went to a, something that they say in Facebook that it was a women at the Capitol day and it was being held by the I'm sorry, that was me, that was me. Uh, it's a nonpartisan, and the whole goal of the commission is to be able to bring um, issues that affect Florida women into our elected officials, especially the cabinet, because each of us is appointed by the cabinet. Um, so I attended about three, three years after that, and it was just an empowering way to realize that you can make a change. Um, then the last year, the third year, I say, well, let me figure out how I get appointed. And I follow the, I follow the, the rules and uh, the second time, uh, because the first time I didn't get appointed and the, there you go about your ñeque, right? You keep trying and trying. And the second time I got appointed by uh, the Senate president, uh, Bill Galvano. And this year I'm serving as the secretary. So it's one as a, as a natural, uh, as a naturalized citizen. This is one of my greatest honors to be able to give back to my community, be a voice for my community and make a change and an impact in women's lives. Now, when we talk about women with the commission, you know, women's are mothers, grandmothers, uh, spouses. So we all benefit. And one of my favorite things to do with the with the commissioners when we go to the uh, to each county and we hold town halls and it's called Voices of Florida Women. And it's so nice to see that when we ask them to come, come out with five things that affect that community, usually the first three are the same across the border, but the last two, they go for that specific community. But at the end, they also know what the solution is going to be. So it's just an empowering way for us to learn what the need is, but also how the solution or what, what a good way to fix it is. And then take that back to our elected officials. Um, if you can, please visit uh, the commission. It's uh, www.fcsw.net www.f for Florida, C for commission, uh, S uh, for state, <laughs> fcsw.net for women, www.fcsw.net. Thank you. Uh, Rose, you can add that to the chat also. So I have a question. Um, can you guys hear me? Good. Uh, for Maureen, I'm trying to find you up there. Um, so during your speech, first off, I just want to uh, say everyone was wonderful. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to all of you. And I took some notes, you know, definitely the common theme, the risk taking, but something else that stuck out to me was that all of you, and I definitely think as an entrepreneur, you have to care. You all have caring personalities. You see that you're something to offer. And that was very evident in, in all of you. Um, so Maureen, you had made a, a comment during your speech that you know, you're looking for the next program for the bank. So from uh, AUSA perspective, I immediately went to, OK, um, are you offering anything for veterans? Do you have certain um, a program that's set aside or special for veterans that they can take advantage of? <clears throat> so. Can you hear me? Okay, we get the, the echo going. <clears throat> so we have a pretty robust program to hire veterans. Um, we do try to be out in the community looking for that. There, when, when we're when we're hiring at our, at our various levels, um, one of the things we do is, you know, people that work for us and work for us successfully, we're pretty sure that they're going to have friends that are similar personalities that are also going to work for us successfully. So we go out to our existing population, we're like, hey guys. You know, we're hiring for this year. Do you know anybody? And by the way, if the person that you know happens to be a veteran and we hire them and it's successful, I'm going to give you like $100 in your bonus once they're, you know, once they, they're hired, et cetera. So we, we, we pay out for that um, within our existing population. 
we also, again, we're, we're out there, you know, when, when we're doing recruiting, we're, we're, we're looking at in, in the colleges, we're, we're out on, on the bases a little bit, trying to actively recruit veterans into the organization, because those guys tend to be very successful for us. You know, as, as a financial organization, we are very rules oriented, we're, you know, we, we tend to be somewhat hierarchical, and folks that have been successful in the military fit in very well within, within that kind of a culture and that organization. So yeah, we, we do have those programs for hiring um, as far as like financial services, depending on in various areas, we, we, we do VA loans, you know, we, we work with, with veterans from a, um, a mortgage perspective, as well as from a, a, an accounting perspective. Mm -hmm. So yes, we have them. Um, we do have, uh, we have some of our, our market folks who are assigned to specifically work with our, our veterans and, and with the army. Um, also, I am not him, so I'm, I'm, I, I can't speak for him, but I, I, I talk to him every month, so we I, do. Thank you. Yeah, that's, I think, one of the advantages, too, of even uh, Eric having this um, format in this forum. It, it's wonderful, just the whole networking aspect of bringing everyone together. And um, I just want to commend Eric on his Pivot to Excellence theme, your series. It's, uh, I wish you luck with it. I think it's, it could, many, many different areas you can take this. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand over the microphone to the first region president, Susan, and she can tell us about the second part of our program, which will will be uh, our federal guests the, the, from the from the uh, Small Business Administration from GSA. So, Susan, here's your microphone. Thank you. I'll take that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so again, welcome everyone. I know everyone's been um, hanging in there through this whole seminar. It's wonderful. Um, I do have the pleasure of uh, first speaker. I'm going to, uh, Terrence, I know you said not read your bio, but I think it's important um, that people uh, know a little bit about your background if they don't already. Uh, so Terrence Moultrie Sr. is the Compliance Chief for the Women-Owned Small Business Federal Contract Program at the Small Business Administration. Uh, he brings extensive knowledge in the areas of women-owned small business eligibility, determination, certification, and acquisition. And before joining the SBA, Terrence was the Chief of Ver Verification Support at the VA's Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. Uh, Terrence is a veteran of the U.S. Army. Thank you, Terrence, for your, for your service. Um, over 22 years of service, and he continued his service in the federal government. He holds a bachelor's of science degree in business administration and currently is taking graduate level courses at Columbia Southern University. So Terrence, welcome. Thank you for being here and so looking forward to your expertise and what you're going to share with us. So thank you. All right. Hey, thank you, everyone. Um, again, thank you for inviting me. Um, and thank you to the previous uh, guest speakers. You guys were great. Um, so without further ado, we can uh, bring up the slides and I will start my briefing on um, uh, Just let me know when you're able to see the slides. All right, great. So, so this morning, we're going to cover um, three main areas, and we're going to talk about taking advantage of our annual prime, the government, I'm sorry, the Women on Small, <laughs> Small Business Federal Contracting Program, the WASB Federal Contracting Program is going to be the topic of the day. Next slide. And we're going to cover pretty much three main topics today. Uh, one of the topics is taking advantage of the annual prime contracting goals, uh, building our capacity and growing, and uh, accessing set asides for women-owned small businesses and economically disadvantaged women-owned small businesses. There's a lot of acronyms out there, but I only want you to concentrate on these two acronyms, women-owned small business and economically disadvantaged women on small business. And I'm going to tell you how we're going to navigate getting through this process so you can take advantage of the economic opportunities in the federal government that are specifically set aside for those two um, uh, economic groups. Okay, next slide. So as you can see, we, we kind of, I kind of gave you the definition of both of the acronyms we're going to use. The WOSBD is the Women on Small Business and the economically, the EDWOSB is the Economic Disadvantaged Women on Small Businesses. Um, what I want to basically 
want you guys to focus on as far as the women on small business, you can see like a pie. There, there's a, a big pie. Um, those are the women on small businesses that are certified through our site, as well as the smaller pie is the economically disadvantaged women on small business, which is a smaller subset of that group. Why is that important to you? That is important to you because as an economically disadvantaged women on small business, you're, you, are, you have the ability to compete in both areas. Not only the women on small business, but the economically disadvantaged women on small businesses as well. There are 444 next codes that are in uh, this particular program that are specifically designed for women on and economically disadvantaged women on small businesses. Uh, you can be a large, considered a large uh, women on small business and still qualify for the economically disadvantaged women on small business as long as you are small within the 444 next codes that are listed. And the link on bullet number four would provide that information for you. All of those 444 next code that you could possibly qualify for. Next slide. Here's some of the uh, certification improvements. The SBA has a new, um, it's, it's a free online certification process for the women on uh, and the economically uh, disadvantaged women on small business. It is a live site. It is up. It's beta.certified.sba.gov. Uh, all women-owned uh, firms need to take action uh, in the new beta, the beta.certified.sba.gov in order to compete for the federal contracting program set aside for women on and economically disadvantaged women on small business. Here's the key. As of October the 15th of, of last year of 2020, uh, there is no longer self-certification for set aside contract. There's still self-certification, but not for set aside contracts across the federal government for women on and economically disadvantaged women on small business. Now, I know that I'm talking to an audience of veterans as well, right? Women-owned veterans that are, that are in this group. And I've talked to a couple of the panelists that are uh, veterans that are, have their CVE certification, as well as some of them have submitted their uh, certification as a women-owned small business. I want you to do both because you qualify for both. You have the potential to qualify for both. Um, and I want you to do that. If you have your 8A certification, um, if you have your hub zone certification, we're going to cover a lot of this through the slides, but you also will qualify as well. I need you to submit your application because I don't want you to miss out on the opportunities uh, that are possibly there for you in the acquisition community. Use your talents and your skills. I'm just going to give you a couple of tools that can help you navigate through the system. Okay. Next slide. We do have our third party certification. We actually have four, what we call TPCs. The SBA has allowed continued participating for the businesses to utilize approved third party certifiers. Now, these individual third party certifiers, they, they charge a fee um, in order to um, uh, review and approve your application through our TPCs. You're still required to submit your application through our beta.certify.sba.gov, uh, but it's a shorter process. So again, if you are a women-owned small business and you meet the criteria through CVE, all right, or your 8A or your hub zone, right, you can submit your application through us with your actual certificate as well. Uh, it is a shorter process, doesn't take as long. Only thing you have to update is pretty much two documents your proof of citizenship and your, your certificate, rather your third party certificate or your uh, for CVE or for ADR for HubZone. Next, next uh, slide, please. The SBA allows participation for firms certified by the following um, entities provided that they meet the qualifications. And, and this is what we talked about, CVE, United States uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, Center for Verification and Evaluation, CVE, as well as 8A. Next slide. Basic qualifications. 
uh, managerial experience. Um, you're not, you, let me quote the, uh, not verbatim, I'm just gonna kind of paraphrase it. You're not, you do not need to necessarily have the managerial experience to run a firm. You just need to have the, the knowledge in order to do so. So in some instances, you don't necessarily need the, the experience um, in order to run the firm, but you need to have the knowledge in how to do so. Highest officer, highest position. Proper next code, you must have 51% ownership um, and control. So the key things I wanna cover here is eligibility. You must be a woman um, in order to qualify for this program. Um, ownership, you must own at least 51% of the firm must be owned and controlled by a combination thereof. So it could be two or more women that own 50% each and you still will meet the qualification for this actual program. It can be three women on, uh, owners that own 33% uh, each. You still meet the qualifications for this program as well. Um, also, when it comes to economic disadvantage qualifications, your personal net uh, worth uh, is less than 750,000. This is the part of the economic disadvantage when on small business. Your average income, is 350,000 or less. Again, this is for economically disadvantaged uh, women on small business. And the value of your assets is $6 million or less. Next, please. For the, the process, uh, here's what I recommend. I recommend that we have a webinar, a monthly webinar that you can participate on. That webinar is live. We don't want to record anything. I want to do everything live because I want to make sure that I'm able to answer your questions uh, live and in color um, because I think that's great customer service in my opinion. Join our webinars if you have any questions on the actual process and what do you need to qualify in order to uh, start the application or what do you need to uh, have in order to uh, start the actual process. So that's number one. Number two is register your business in sam.gov. Again, if you're going for federal contracts, you have to register it as well because that's how you get paid. Uh, one of the key tips in SAM.gov, a lot of the women on small businesses, they don't make themselves the owner of the firm, the primary contact. That's a pitfall that I need you guys to fix for me when you register your business in SAMs or if your business is already registered, registered in SAM, make sure that in SAMs, you are listed as the primary point of contact. Again, you can visit our site at beta.certified.sba.gov. Next slide, please. Here's some helpful tips. Again, I talked to you about our webinars. We have access to our checklist that provides guidance uh, prior to you uh, applying your uh, verification eligibility, find out answers to questions regarding your firm's ability to participate in the program, request information from the SBA by submitting a help form, uh, creating an account. Um, you can do that as well, how to create an account. You have access to our system with our knowledge-based articles. Uh, within the next two months, well, I'll say within, yeah, let me give myself 60 days, you're gonna actually start seeing videos on how-to videos. If you are stuck in a certain position, like right now, some of our uh, women on small business are having problems uploading documents. So guess what we're doing right now? We're creating a, a video. My team is creating a video on how to upload documents. So we're going to walk you through it, a video, because sometimes individuals might learn by reading a particular document and they can get through it. And sometimes, for instance, myself, I would like to see it live, kind of walk me through it. So we're going to do that as part of our customer service and making sure that we provide the best co customer service we can at this particular time. Next slide. Here's some training resources we actually have. Uh, document preparation and checklist. Uh, there's a link to that. Um, the eligibility uh, questionnaire, um, as well as the check base, our knowledge base articles, our user guide, our ongoing training and webinar. I would like for you guys to take advantage of all this prior to submitting your application. One of the things I found out is that when individuals go through uh, our webinars, as well as a checklist, and, and look at the knowledge-based articles prior to submitting the application, they are less likely to have difficulties going through the process. 
doesn't mean they don't have issues going through the process because sometimes they do, but they're less likely to get frustrated through the process because they understand what it takes, what documents is actually needed and how long this process is going to actually take. Okay, next slide. Okay, next one, abracadabra, boof, it's coming. It's coming, I promise. You can't see it? <laughs> no, ma'am. Not the next one. The contact us one? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, see, my mind is playing tricks. I need to put my glasses on. <laughs> now, again, if you want to contact us, <laughs> one on one assistance, we also have our local SBA uh, resource partners that can actually assist you as well. Um, there's a link for that um, that you can actually use for more information on keeping informed with different events. That, we act, that the SBAs have in combination, not only with the SBA, but GSA as well. Uh, any events that we may partner with other uh, government agencies, that's listed on our website. For questions in reference to our federal contracting program, you can email us at the wasby at sba.gov. For this particular event, for training events, I want you to pay attention. If you are on this particular call, and I believe that we have, one second, I think we have 25 participants, right? I'm gonna give you a secret sauce for today, ladies and gentlemen. This is the secret sauce for today. The secret sauce today is that if you have a question or you have an issue with the actual process, I want you to email our WASB training at sba.gov. In the subject line, it's very important. Please write this down. I want you to put attention, Terrence, right? And my team will get that information to me directly. I have no problem giving you a call or emailing you back if you have any questions or, or issues. Or someone on my team will make sure that we answer your particular question. But for this particular webinar, for the 26 individuals on this particular webinar, I'm going to try to give you some special treatment. I call it show me some love. So I'm going to show you some love. By if you have an issue, you have a problem, please email me in the subject line. You put attention Terrence. That's going to come directly to my team. My team uh, monitors email box and I will ensure that we get back with you within 72 hours. Now, I'm saying 72 hours because I would like to give myself a little cushion. But if it goes past 48 hours, we have a problem. Okay? So I believe to make sure that we try to take care of you guys as best as we possibly can. Karen, For any technical help, yes, ma'am. That was the, the WASB training at sba.gov email address? Yes, yes, ma yes ma'am. That is it. WASB training at sba.gov. And you put it in the subject line. What are you going to put on the subject line? Attention, Terrence. That's what I'm talking about. See, somebody is paying attention. So you put attention, uh, uh, attention, Terrence. We'll make sure that we provide you a, a solid answer. And I will make sure that I get back with you as soon as we possibly can. All right. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to give you another, another special nugget. I don't want you to share this with anybody because I'm only giving to you. This is the one time and one time offer only. I'm going to give you my cell phone number. It's a government cell phone number, so it doesn't belong to me because you pay taxes, right? Here's my cell phone number. My cell phone number is 202-702-2874. Again, that number is 202-702-2874. That comes directly to me. It doesn't go to a help desk or anybody else. I'm the only one to answer that phone. So again, if you cannot get in contact with somebody or or someone on my team did not respond to you when you emailed the WASB training at sba.gov and you put attention Terrence and my team did not get in contact with you or I did not, please give me a call because that means there's an issue. Is that fair? See, today is women's, I mean, this month is Women's History Month, but today is Women's Appreciation Day by the SBA. That's what I want to count, all right? All right, next, next slide. That's it. Okay. Now, here's why I want to I want to recap a couple things. I want to ensure if you're a women owned small business and you're an owner and you own 51% of your firm and you own and control that firm, there's no reason why you should not submit an application through our site. That's, that's, I'm going to tell you that that's criminal because what you're doing is you're minimizing your opportunities um, to grow and expand your firm and expand your business. And I know you don't want to do that. So give yourself the best opportunity possible to grow your business moving forward. That is applying for 
of the certification program through the SBA. As a women-owned small business or economic disadvantage on uh, women-owned small business, I will tell you the average processing time regulation requires us to process an application in 90 days. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we are above that 90 days. I will tell you that once you have submitted your application, if you have not heard anything within 120 days, give me a call directly and I will look into what is the issue. I owe you that. But I will ask for you to be patient, provide us the documents that you need, that we ask for. Don't need to argue, don't need to fuss, don't need to say, ask why. If there's a document that is required, provide that document. If you do not have that document, and there are some times that you may not have a particular document because you're a newly formed uh, firm, all I need you to do is provide a detailed letter of explanation on why you don't have that particular document. If it makes sense, you're okay. If it doesn't make sense, we're going to ask you a question, a question. So don't take it, don't ever take it personal. Um, we're not verifying the firm. We're verifying that you meet the qualifications for this particular program. As long as you meet the qualifications for this program, it's my job to ensure that you get through this process in a timely fashion so you can take advantage of the economic opportunities that uh, the federal government needs wants and desires and has specifically set aside 5% of their budget, specifically for contract budget, specifically for women on and economic disadvantaged women on small business. I hope that I've answered all your questions. If I have not, um, feel free to ask any questions that you want or send me the question that you have directly to our email box and we'll make sure we get back to you. I hope I answered your question and I hope um, you guys got some of this. Thank you, Terry. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Susan? Oh, sorry. Yes, great. Thank you. And I love the uh, handing out your uh, phone number, personal phone number and all that. That's uh, That means you really care and appreciate it. So um, I think we all have a lot to learn. Um, and we can definitely use the websites that you provided. And thank you so much for joining. Um, yes, so I'm now going to introduce Kiana. Houston, hello. Thank you for being patient through the whole through the whole program. Um, I did get a little bit of information. Uh, where are you? There you are. So I'm just going to read through it. And by uh, these four little sentences, certainly doesn't cover your the your broad spectrum of the talents that you bring to the table, but I'll just take two seconds here to introduce you what I have. Uh, you're a director of acquisition management division for GSA Region 4. Uh, you're a certified federal contracting professional and a member of the Defense Acquisition Corps. Uh, you are a visionary leader, professional business advisor specializing in federal government contracting and business development. Uh, you hold a Bachelor of Science degree in management from the Alabama Al Agriculture and Mechanical University and an M MBA from Walden University. And then we were discussing that you're also an author, you have a few books. You also own a few businesses, entrepreneur you're, you're yourself, go out there uh, doing your own business. Uh, so welcome. And I turn the mic over to you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me today. Yes, I, I'm a, a jack of all trades in, in many different ways, um, but I am a, in the federal space. So of course I do not bid on federal contracts. So that that is one important thing is, um, when you're in in the role that I play, but I'm Kiana Houston. I am the Director of Acquisitions for the General Services Administration Public Building Services uh, side of the house. Um, so one, one thing that's important to know is I've been a DOD contracting officer for most of my career. So I've been on the DOD space and I crossed over into the federal space in 2019 in July when I was hired on as the acquisition director here in Atlanta, Georgia area. And I'm excited to share with you a little bit about GSA um, because there's kind of a misnomer when people think GSA, you're like, oh, GSA schedules, yay. But there's more than one side to GSA. I work in the public building services and in that side, we actually do all of the, we own it, all of the federally owned and leased buildings. So we actually maintain the buildings, not um, the schedules. But I do have some slides to talk to you about the GSA schedules because it's important to know about that best in class vehicle um, as it is one of the vehicles that we do use um, to purchase uh, various items, supplies and services for uh, the federal 
space. So if I'm just waiting for the slides to be brought up. But thank you so much, Cindy. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the two sides of GSA that we're going to talk about the GSA Federal Acquisition Service and the schedules process a little bit. Um, I cannot take ownership of those slides. I do have the, the POCs who provided me those slides and their contact information in the presentation, but I'll go over the GSA schedules a little bit. I'm also going to go over Region 4 PBS, which is the Public Building Services. And that's the section of uh, the GSA that I am actually the Director of Acquisitions for. I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about the PBS side, um, specifically to the Small Disadvantage, uh, the Office of Small Disadvantaged Business Utilization, which we call the OSDBU office, which is equivalent to our, our, our uh, miniature SBA within GSA. That, that's our small business points of contact. I'm going to go over some information about them as well, um, and some information that's important to know about doing business with GSA. Next slide, please. So for, of course, we want to start off with how to, how to do business with GSA. And, and the first thing I always want to point people to is how to get on the, uh, the multiple award schedule, also known as the MAS, M-A-S. Um, um, that is one of our, our main places that when you think of GSA, where you want to go. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And so, the first thing you want to do when when you're when you're thinking about doing business with the with GSA specifically and and trying to get on schedule to have that opportunity for you to do business within the federal space because remember the GSA schedules are not just for GSA they are considered a best in class vehicle so um, a, a few years ago and probably five seven years ago um, we the DOD side came out with the better buying power initiatives and that's kind of morphed through federal acquisition law and so we have what's called best in class vehicles and and the GSA schedules are one of them what that means is that there is a type of platform that you can order contracts from or order, order uh, goods and services from um, that has some built in benefits to them um, GSA schedules meaning that we've already have some pre vetted vendors. And so um, where you've had your qualifications vetted you've been awarded this contract and now the federal space has an opportunity to purchase off of that where they put out solicitations into the GSA schedule space utilizing the GSA e buy system. Now, one of the things to note with the GSA schedules is that um, it is not mandatory for federal government to order off of them. So it's important for you to really figure out, are you a good fit? You want to do your research, right? You want to know about the schedules. You want to go out there and utilize all the resources that are on the websites and figure out what kind of federal agencies are purchasing off of those GSA schedules, um, look at the, um, your postings on the eBuy system to see kind of the trends of what kind of things have been purchased um, on the GSA schedules, how often they've been purchased, if there's large gaps in time where things have been purchased. I like to compare the GSA schedules and the, um, the uh, Federal Business Opportunity, FBO, to kind of see where agencies are purchasing from and what kinds of things they're purchasing from. Um, you want to pre understand those prerequisites to getting on the schedule. You know, you have to have been in business for two years and provide two years of financial statements. So you want to have a, a, some kind of history of having a, a being able to sustain your business. You want to uh, three or more federal contracts with the acceptable rating and CPAR. So that's for businesses that, you know, have kind of been established and you've gotten that kind of that foot in the door in the federal space. Remember, you don't have to be on schedule to, to have been awarded federal contracts. So you want to be able to, to have that past performance history. Um, and the CPARS is where we do our past performance history. Um, remember, if there are no, no uh, CPARS ratings because you haven't won a federal contract, that's not a bad thing, right? The, the federal acquisition regulation gives us some guidelines to how to handle that. And so your solicitation when you're submitting on that will speak to that specifically. The key here is making sure that you, you're understanding kind of what you're getting yourself into and that you're, you've established yourself as a strong business that's ready to move to the next level. Doesn't mean that you have, haven't had commercial businesses, haven't, or, or excuse me, done business with commercial companies, but when entering into the federal space, you really want to have built that background. I'm going to put a note here as well that there is a difference between past performance and experience. You'll often see in the, in, in the, uh, the solicitation world where we're asking for your past 
past performance and your experience. Though they often seem similar, they we're looking for different things. Past performance is speaking to how well you've performed on contracts, um, as far as the the uh, outcomes were the the um, the ex the outputs that you put out. Were your are your customers happy with what you did? Were you on time? Were there quality schedule? Th you know, did you maintain the schedule? Were your cost constraints good? Those kind of things. That's your past performance. But your experience is speaking to how long and how well you're doing the job. So how did you perform? How well did you perform? Were you utilizing good supplies? Were you, you know, did you have a good supply chain? Things of that nature. So wanted to point that out. And the last thing you want to think about when you're thinking about schedules are, you know, the application process. It's lengthy. So you don't want to try to go in and get a GSA schedule to bid on a solicitation that's already out there and which is closing in a month. You, you won't get on schedule on time. It's a lengthy process to get on the, the, um, the mass schedules. So you have to be mindful of the timing it takes to get on the schedules because it can take up to 12 months and sometimes more depending on which, uh, which of the schedules you're going to. Next slide, please. Um, so this, this slide is going to talk about the um, roadmap for schedule holders. As I talked about, there are a lot of resources available for you, but you want to make sure that you're getting ready. So you've done your research on the schedules, what's requirements, what agencies are bidding off of it, if it's agencies that you're looking to, um, to have purchasing your goods and services because you think you're a good fit. You want to make sure that you are assembling your offer according to the solicitation, right? You're looking at what they're asking for. Um, if you're in... Uh, you want to look at section L and M of the solicitation. Section L is your instruction to offers, and M is how we're going to evaluate your uh, your evaluate, uh, your offer that you're submitting. So you want to dive into that and looking at the tasks uh, and deliverables that are being asked to make sure that you can provide um, a really detailed offer to show how you're going to be able to do that. A lot of times, the misconception this conception is, um, or a, a lot of mistakes that businesses make is they don't read the solicitation in its entirety. We really, even if there's very lengthy, you really got to read the solicitation and make sure you dive into what we're asking you for, because a lot of times businesses try to give us kind of their capabilities built into it. And when we're evaluating your offer, we don't care about just the blanket capability statement where you're giving me the fluff about your business. I want to know, can you do the work? give me the details of what I'm asking you for. It's great that you've been in business for 15 years and you've been in international spaces and all that fluff language that you do in the cover letter. Most times we're, 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 we're skimming through that. We're looking for the meat of it and we're making sure that you didn't exceed your page count. So be mindful of that. But also um, we want to make sure that you're finalizing your offer. If it's a negotiated procurement, you're going to have multiple steps in your procurement where you're going to assemble your initial offer. You're going to submit it. It's going to be an evaluation. They open up for negotiations to talk through different aspects of your uh, proposal. And then we're going to go into your final offer um, where you're going to give us your best and final, where you're going to revise your offer based off of um, those negotiations. Not every procurement is negotiated. So you should always present your offer as if it was your best and final offer um, because not every procurement is negotiated. Next slide, please. We want to make sure that you're going through that when you're getting ready that we train you. So you want to look at those uh, the pathways to success information on that site. You want to do your readiness assessment and training, all of available on the website um, on GSA schedules the site that was on the previous slide on that roadmap. Um, there's hyperlinks throughout the roadmap that will bring you to different sections of the GSA website. You can go on the eBuy website and find um, training resources there. You can go to GSA's website. Um, the other thing, the next thing you want to do is make sure you register. So you do need to have, make sure you have a DUNS number. The DUNS number is your Dun and Bradstreet number. Um, it's important to have that because that's usually where we're looking for your financial capabilities, um, depending on the size of the business. Um, well, in general, that's where we look for their financial capabilities through Dun and Bradstreet. Um, you want to make sure you're registered for SAM. That is a requirement for all federal contracts that you have to be registered in SAM. Um, we want to make sure that you have strong past performance. Um, if you haven't done work in your federal space, remember that in your solicitation, your corporate experience is just as important, right? You want to make sure that when you're speaking to your past performance, many solicitations ask for a questionnaire. So get those those companies that you did, you know, that you exceeded expectation to to uh, vouch for you, to give you that that feedback, and then interact, right? Um, 
when we're when we're talking about interact here come to our industry days respond to our rfis uh if we're if we're putting out information to say hey we're thinking about doing something a lot of times we have not made a decision um if we're putting out a request for information or some form of market resource source of SOT information many businesses miss an opportunity to shape our procurements because they don't respond if we're putting out that information, it means that we're looking to shape how we're going to buy something. And we, we don't know who's out there in the market. Um, a new businesses, a new business enters the market on, on a daily basis. So a lot of times we put that information out to gather from you maybe the best way to procure something or maybe a, a different way to maybe consider how we group our contracts or maybe to consider what kind of set asides are available to us um, where we haven't thought about maybe setting aside for a woman-owned small business or economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business. Um, respond to that information. Um, and, and a lot of, and also a lot of times we're not quite sure what market price is. So we're asking you for range information. We want to know what is the market paying for that that thing that we're buying? What's what's the going rate for that these these days? Um, the federal government oftentimes is a little behind the curve when it comes to things of that nature because industry is moving ahead all the time. It's a known fact that when you talk to technology, industry is well of far advanced beyond, beyond the federal government. So we're looking to you to provide us that kind of information. And then the last thing is make sure you understand the solicitation. So here, there's an example here of a solicitation. Um, typically, the, the biggest difference you'll see is an RFQ versus an RFP, request for quote versus a request for proposal. Request for quote is typically uh, a, pro a proposal being asked on GSA schedule specifically. Request for proposals are typically off of schedule. So that's one of the key, the keys there. But here we have a couple of links as well as a YouTube video to actually walk you through a solicitation to help you break down those parts. Next slide, please. So here, next, you're going to want to assemble your offer. Your offer. So uh, again, this is for you getting on schedule. So you're going to want your agent authorization letter, your letter of supply, and you utilizing your price proposal templates, which is the three forms that are going to be um, required for being getting on schedule. And then the the next set, and I'm not going to read all these to you, but you're wanting to make sure that you have all of this information in advance. Um, it requires a little bit of, of pre work to before you start looking to bid on contracts. So this kind of gives you a, a example of things that you want to make sure you're you have in advance. Financial statements. Again, if you don't have a strong Dun and Bradstreet uh, background because you're, maybe you're newer to Dun and Bradstreet and they haven't. Uh, determined your financial capability or giving you that grade, having those financial statements help uh, give us an idea of how well you're able to maintain your business. Um, subcontracting plans, who are you doing business with? Um, are you, you know, outsourcing everything, you know? Um, Terrence spoke to about that 51% ownership. We look at that. Um, it's very important that we, we know who's owning the company and the makeup of the company. And it, are you outsourcing everything or are you becoming just a middleman? Are we paying higher prices because we're paying your overhead plus the other company's overhead? Because oftentimes when we see that trend, we're going to try to get to the, the, end, the source company and, and cut out the middleman to save the taxpayer dollar. Um, we're going to look at your pricing list. Are your prices, you know, in line with other markets uh, uh, of other businesses in, in the same market? Are they similar? Are they grossly higher or too, too low? We're looking for that. Um, being too low on an offer is not actually a good thing. Um, we have two different types of buying. We buy lowest price technically acceptable and best value trade-off process, right? Sometimes low prices indicate a lack of understanding. The same for ex, ex, um, ex, extremely high prices. It means that there's a, some kind of lack of understanding. So your goal is kind of be, to be in line with industry, but making sure that you ensure that you've kept taking care of your expenses as well. Um, next slide, please. And next, you're going to finalize your offer. And so here, that's when we, we're talking about going ahead and submitting that offer into the e-offer uh, 
site here, there's a hyperlink there in this presentation. So when you get a copy of that, you'll be able to click on all these links. But that's going to allow you to complete the information, download and update the template, sign electronically, and really submit your offer to uh, GSA um, to the FAST side so that they can, a federal acquisition service, so that they can evaluate your offer and determine if, um, if you're going to be eligible for a GSA schedule. They're going to review that offer, right? They're going to review it, make sure that it's in line. They may actually open negotiations with you to negotiate at different aspects of it, specific NAICS codes or um, SIN numbers, things of that nature. And, and, and then uh, you're going to want to sell yourself, right? You're going to want to make sure that they know that you are ready for this work. So now you're able to market and sell your services. Once you finalize your offer and you win that schedule, now it's about you marketing yourself to the world, okay? So making sure that those people who are on the GSA schedules that are buying from the GSA schedules know that you're a schedule holder because that's a tool that we can use that often helps us streamline how we buy. Next slide, please. So uh, at PBS specifically, we are off, we often buy from this particular schedule. This is the um, category the uh, 50, uh, 56 121 excuse me 121 or one. 56-12-10 fax uh, schedule. This is for the facility maintenance and management. Um, this is specific, uh, the specific schedule that uh, PBS purchases from. We, it used to be called the O3 fax schedule. Um, again, my agency, my, my part of the agency does maintain buildings. So I wanted to put this in here for you all to let you know the kind of services that we're looking to purchase. Um, it's mostly, again, um, maintaining buildings. We do some janitorial and custodial, grounds maintenance, interior plant. Um, uh, we do building automations and all kind of uh, different things, uh, elevator maintenance, anything that it required to, to run a building, we do. Um, from run, putting the carpet down to painting the walls, you name it, we do it. And so this is the primary schedule that we purchase from when we're purchasing off of the GSA schedules, but it's not the only place we buy from. So I just wanted to share that with you as well. Next slide. Um, and again, this is talking to the uh, specific to the PBS side um, of our, what we're looking for here and those, some of those ancillary service. So we're looking for a full service solution right so we're looking for uh, your ability to uh, to provide uh, different levels of service we're really looking to partner with industry in order to maintain our buildings so we're not trying to buy a whole we're not trying to have you know 12 contracts in one in one office um, you know if we're doing a judge's chambers um, oftentimes we're looking for that full service solution to how we can um, to get the one contract to do it all so we're often having our businesses partner with each other we encourage smaller businesses to to get with some of those um, other more established small businesses or larger businesses that have been doing business with PBS because we do purchase a lot of our uh, contracts off of um, indefinite delivery vehicles or off of GSA schedules. So we're often looking for those partnering opportunities. Next slide, please. So I'm going to transition now over to the public building services, which is the agency and which I am the director of acquisitions. Next slide, please. And so uh, the PBS portion of, of GSA has about 760 employees across, uh, uh, specifically in Region 4, we have about 760 employees across eight states. So I am the regional director of contract over, contracting over eight states. And yes, I have visited almost all of those states prior to pandemic. I spent the first six months of my GSA career traveling to the field to meet everyone because I do have staff out in the field. Um, and so... Uh, we currently manage about 141 federally owned facilities. We have close to uh, a little bit more than um, 1,300 commercially owned facilities uh, and 44.4 million rentable square feet. That does change all the time because we are always acquiring new spaces and disposing of spaces. But this is kind of where our stats are right now. And um, Region 4 is the second largest uh, region in PBS, next to the National Capital Region, which is in DC, as far as square footage. Uh, next slide, please. 
we manage 67 historic buildings. So there's opportunities for, um, for companies who do uh, art restoration and historic preservation. There, there, we have fine arts and things of that nature. Again, we maintain buildings holistically. And so we have uh, historic buildings as well as um, 444 that work in the fine arts collected and 78 in the art and architecture program. So that's something I also wanted to point out because we wanted to show you that our, our work that we are maintaining the building is vast and broad. Next slide, please. We maintain energy and environment. So when maintaining the buildings, we want to make sure that we are um, staying in, in line with all of the environmental energy and economic performance. Um, for the executive order 13693. And so we have education and awareness. Uh, we do uh, where we talk about buying green and maintaining sustainable buildings so that we are uh, reducing um, the omission of, uh, of chemicals into the uh, ozone as well as waste um, into, the, into the waters. We do design and review of construction alteration program uh, projects. Uh, with those uh, energy uh, initiatives in mind. Um, if you think of GSA, PBS, we're, uh, you'll, you'll think of us in more terms of more construction geared businesses because we do a lot of um, build outs with um, federal courts and things of that nature. Next slide, please. Uh, recommissioning and retro commissioning here. So that's where we're taking ex existing buildings and we're gutting them and redesigning them to make them more efficient, maybe putting a facelift on them when they're getting a, a little older or not maintained as well, especially some of the older buildings. Um, project development where we're looking for um, energy and water conservation, sustainable operations and smart buildings where we're, we're utilizing technology to be smarter about how we manage our business our buildings, um, whether we're near or far. So we're looking at how to how can we manage buildings from anywhere we are in the world. Uh, so we're utilizing technology through that. Um, and then, uh, of course, optimizing performance of the buildings to make sure we reduce our energy footprint um, and keep costs low. Next slide, please. Building automation, I kind of touched on that a little bit, but um, here are a couple of highlights about our building automation program, which is a really big feather in our hat as we have been able to optimize some of our most historic buildings. Region 4 has some of the most historic buildings in GSA. It's, um, portfolio. And so we've been able to, to utilize some of this technology, as I talked about, with, um, with our energy initiatives of even some of the oldest buildings in our portfolio, being able to kind of um, optimize them and, and really have them performing so that they're energy efficient, as well as updating them to, to meet current standards. So that, that's something really important to us. Next slide, please. And so for the acquisition management specifically, uh, this office was actually established as a standalone office in 2009. So acquisitions has always existed, right? The government buys stuff, we've always had to buy stuff, but we, was, we were stood up in 2009 as a, a separate entity within PBS. And that was important because it was the first time we separated acquisitions from under their customers, which was very important because when you're working for your customer, sometimes there's um, conflicts of um, who's on first or, or what, what, what mission are you serving? Um, do, are you following the regulations? Or are you following what your customer is telling you because they're signing your paycheck? So this helped delineate some of those conflicts there. Next slide, please. Our vision and our, our mission is to deliver quality on-time service within budget, minimizing risk to the procurement while staying within regulatory guidance. And we want to have the most highly respected and dynamic source of design, construction, and service acquisition expertise. In layman's terms, we want to be the best, right? I want my people to be the best that they can possibly be, to be professional, and also make sure that we are on time, on budget, and minimize your risk. We want to help you get to your end goal. And we're doing that through uh, partnership, collaboration, and really staying true to our five principles of AMD. Next slide, please. Overall, our divisional area of responsibility, I've touched on most of this already, but we do uh, oversee the acquisition workforce and training development. We could um, coordinate uh, procurement preference programs. We maintain our vendor relationships. That is a very important thing for us. Um, provide oversight and acquisition training and a broad range of contracting services related to that facility management and design construction. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
Uh, we also are really, we focus on being business advisors and providing sound business advice. Um, again, we, we, our primary focus is on the management and, and procurement of commodities and services to, uh, within, with the facilities operation and maintenance in mind. Um, and we do execute um, acquisitions on behalf of our offices, which we affectionately call our PMCs, our property management centers. And we all always in, uh, concerned with staying in compliance with all laws, regulations, and policies. Next slide, please. Here you have my contact information. I am Kiana Houston. I am the director, regional director of acquisitions. My email address is provided there for you, as well as this website to the region for acquisitions. But just like Terrence, if you have questions, myself and my staff are available. And so just like Terrence, my government phone here, it's not paid for by me, right? And so it's readily available to you. So my number is 404-889-7641. Again, 88, excuse me, 404-889-7641. If you have any questions on acquisition related, um, anything with PBS, I will be happy to answer to you. If you have questions specific to the GSA schedules, I'll make sure to get you in contact with the right person. Next slide. I have just a few more slides. Of, I know this is a long presentation, but GSA is far and wide, and I wanted to make sure I gave you a comprehensive look at GSA. So the Office of Small Business Utilization or Small Disadvantaged Business Utilization is, is head by Chastity Assey Major George here in Region 4. Next slide, please. And so they have nationwide responsibility for small business programs. So that means that they are the advocate for small businesses, small disadvantaged businesses, women owned small businesses, women uh, economically disadvantaged small businesses. If you are any, in any small business socioeconomic category, they are your advocate to GSA. Next slide, please. This slide is a little hard to read, but the key thing I wanted to point out here is I want you to make sure that you go to this website about subcontracting. As I mentioned early on in the presentation at GSA PBS specifically, a lot of our business is purchased off of existing contract vehicles. What that means is we put in contracts in place to be able to purchase off of them to be able to quickly respond to our, our buildings and our tenants needs. So we're off, always looking for opportunities for businesses to subcontract, for creating new subcontracting opportunities. And so this directory is going to help you partner and, and get in touch with those opportunities. Um, it provides you the, the ability to gain experience without being primes on um, contracts and later become primes. And so we wanted to make sure that you know this information. So please make sure you go to that website and be familiar with the information being provided there for you. Next slide, please. Again, this is a little small, but what we're here, we want to make sure that when you're marketing yourself to, to, for federal contracts, especially when you're entering the federal space, we want you to uh, do your research. Look at um, the FPDS data. That's a, a national repository of everything the government buys, regardless of the agency. We have to feed that information into the federal procurement data system, or FPDS. Um, so we want you to go out there and do your research. Look for NAICS codes that are in line with your businesses. Get familiar with the kind of companies that are, are winning contracts and what kind of things that they're, uh, the kind of pricing that they're winning for, for over the terms of contract, things of that nature. We want you to become familiar with, um, with marketing yourselves. And, and the best way to market yourself is to know the businesses that you're trying to market to. Um, so there's some links here. Again, we have the FPDS site. We have SAM.gov, the beta.sam.gov. Um, we do post a lot of solicitations there, but there's also a lot of information there. Um, we also say reach out to SBA. Terrence is a great resource for you, but SBA has a lot of resources on their website. And lastly, um, the Procurement Technical Assistant um, Center, the PTAC, um, they have a website as well where they can help with additional as assistance from a marketing standpoint, suggest contracts, uh, different um, prime businesses that you may want to partner with. So we want to make sure that you utilize your resources to finding those subcontracting opportunities, especially when you're first trying to enter into the, the federal space. Next slide, please. Here is Chastity and Majors contact information. Uh, again, um, they're 
email is provided to you, as well as the link to our G region four, as well as their site. So if there's, uh, there's a lot of information on those sites, so please go there. And if you have any questions, by all means, reach out to them at that email, they do monitor that email as well. And I think that's it. Next slide. We're going to have a Q and A question, uh, session at the end, so if you can go to the next slide, I just want to thank you on behalf of GSA for allowing me to talk to you today about the Federal Acquisition Service, the Public Building Services, and our Small Business Office to all partner with you to help you do business with GSA and your future uh, opportunities with the federal government. Thank you so much for your time. I am Kiana Houston, and it has been my pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you, Kiana. It was wonderful. Thank you. So my first, um, I actually had a GSA contract. My, our, my the first um, solicitation I ever had to write, I we were going to hire like a third party to help write it. And I'm like, I'll never learn the process if I don't do it myself. So that was like in 1999. So, so thank you. Thank you. Um, Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm not sure. I don't see him up there, but... I know he's not here. Sure. <laughs> Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Yep. Yeah. I was watching you so much, everybody. It was so fun. Um, yeah. Do we have any questions from the floor for our panelists or for our for our uh, speakers, for Kiana and Houston, or for any of the entrepreneur panelists? Or would an, uh, any of the panelists like to offer? ask questions of our speakers. I don't I don't have any questions, but I want to add in reference to, you know, seeking government contracts since I work with so the, so many of these entrepreneurs that one they want to get them. Uh, sometimes they're not ready. They're not ready for them. Uh, as you scale, you have to be ready to grow. And and we see a lot of this where it's a lot of small entrepreneurs want to apply, but they're not ready. They don't meet the requirements that um, she was talking about. So just be cognizant of that. And that's why we we promote that that uh, that partnership with becoming subcontracting with some of those other businesses because sometimes you're not quite ready to hold that contract by yourself, but you have something to offer. Um, we have learned great partnerships with our, our companies with through their subcontracting opportunities, whether it's something as minor as their janitorial services, where we have the guy who's cleaning their the, you know picking up the trash um, when they're on the construction site to the person who's actually helping put the HVAC in the building. Um, those small, those partnerships, no matter how large or small they are, help you gain that experience to do business with us. And, and you may not be ready right away, but you definitely will be able to um, partner. I, thank you. I, I have a comment to that, Eric, if I can. Um, kind of tie in, in AUSA and all the community partners and you know, reaching like networking and helping each other. That's part of what AUSA is all about. So I know there's always been efforts on um, for, for first region, we're trying to do like a, not a mentorship program, but just like a, um, oh, I forget what I even call it, but where I'm trying to help the community, the chapters reach out to the community members, but even have an SBA's um, trying to network with those companies that aren't familiar with AUSA, there's got to be a way we can link this all together with working with um, the SBA office and GSA more closely. Um, I mean, I, I know we do at some level, but, you know, taking it down to that chapter level. I can tell you that in Europe, when I was the European region president, we had a, we found that there was a need from our members that they were asking us to teach about government contracting processes because it was too confusing for them. And they had spent so much money hiring snake oil salespeople to pay somebody to do it. And so we started offering the classes and teaching um, and that, that was very good. And it, they, they were very appreciative of that because they finally understood the process in a fair, a fair manner that wasn't trying to just sell them something. Right. Right. Like this forum right now is wonderful. Right. That's so, you know, just reaching out more to, um, I, go ahead. I, I got a question from the, from an anonymous attendee. Kiana, could you please explain 
what's an industry day and how it can help a, a woman-owned small business or other small business seeking to work with GSA? So industry day is often when we are um, either going out to, uh, to tell industry what it is that we're looking to purchase in the future. So it's prior to doing, putting out market research or a request for information. Um, it's, it's one of our forms that we use to kind of build relationships and network with businesses. And so um, we've recently, are, we're, we sometimes target to a specific area. So I just participated in industry day for North and South Carolina because we're doing some really new, cool new contracts in that area. And so um, we, we held an industry day for that. Um, sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll uh, hear industry days are similar to site visits, but they're a little different. Industry days are really geared more towards bringing industry together with your government partners and networking. It's oftentimes we're presenting information to you about what it is that we're looking to do either now or in the future. We're also looking to make those connections and kind of pick your brains on maybe again, how we're gonna do some things because maybe we haven't filled in all the gaps, but it's really that big opportunity. Uh, and we do it a few times a year. DOD used to have some really great ones where they would have some really big industry days. Um, GSA, specific PBS, it's something newer that we're doing where we're providing industry days when we're doing um, either new things with our contracts or maybe revising how we're soliciting information. We're trying to really partner with industry. So that's kind of what the intent behind industry day is. It's really networking and partnering with industry industry, bringing you together and collaborating on whether it's a procurement that we're going to put out or really just um, letting you know what, what we're doing, what we do, and how you can do business with us. So it's, it's kind of that broad forum. Um, there's a few different versions of that because um, I know our Osbu office has their, their small business um, industry days where they do capabilities, where they bring in uh, small businesses to present their capabilities to the government and dialogue with us from that standpoint. And again, the site visits are really when they're a little bit more specific to um, an actual procurement where we're bringing you on site to look at what it is we're trying to purchase and have you actually dive in to look through um, that building or what it is that solicitation is. But the broad industry day is really just a, an opportunity for you to network with us and kind of see what we're doing and what we're, what we're, we're, um, what we're doing, what we're trying to buy in either now or in the future. Um, we also oftentimes talk about future capabilities or future procurements at that time where we'll share, hey, this is what we're looking to buy over the next uh, six to 12 months um, if that information is available. And so we try to share that as well at industry day. So you can start planning for the kind of things that you want to build or bid on. Kiana, do they, yes. do they post the industry no notices on Beta Sam? Yes, most of the time our industry days, we, we typically we depending on if we're buying them uh, full and open or on schedules, we typically it will post them in both. But most industry days are going to be posted on beta.sam. Um, and every once in a while, I would say kind of 50 50. We also would post the same thing on the GSA as a source of SOT information that, hey, this is going to be coming up. So when we're talking about requests for information or putting those source of SOT notices in there, got to read them in their entirety because most of the time at the very end, that's when we're going to tell you that we're going to have some kind of industry day um, or some kind of networking opportunity. So um, reading becomes really important because we, we bury a lot of stuff in one spot. Um, and typically it's between those two. Um, but Every, almost everything gets posted on beta.sam as well. I, I have a question for Terrence. Terrence, um, what's the difference? What's the advantage between WASB, ED WASB, and 8A? It, like, if I if I had a if my business was obviously if if I was a was a chick, right? And I had a biz, a WASP business, and then I wanted to get an ED WASP. Should I? Does that upgrade automatically somehow? Do I, is it a speeded up process? And and what's the difference between that and eight eight A? So so eight A, I'm I'm not that familiar with the eight A program itself, but there there is a difference between the WASP and the Ed and Ed WASP and the eight A. There's two different types of actual programs. And the qualifications are different in the two. Uh, but if you are a Ed WASB, if you qualify as an Ed WASB, you automatically qualify as a WASB. I'll give you an example. If you are a service disabled veteran, right? If you qualify as a service disabled veteran, which is a, if you want to say a higher echelon, if you want to say that, right, uh, then you still qualify as a veteran on small business. 
So if you're Ed Wasby, qualify as an Ed Wasby, then you still meet the qualification for a Wasby. So you remember that one diagram that showed you that you the, the pie chart, you are able to compete in both arenas. You can compete in the women on small business arena as far as acquisition opportunities, and you're able to compete in the Ed Wasby, uh, I mean, in the ED Wasby as well, the economic disadvantage uh, opportunity as well. If you're uh, uh, qualify as a WASB, women on small business, you cannot uh, participate in the Ed WASB uh, acquisition opportunities. But if you're a WASB, you can participate. I mean, if you're Ed WASB, you can participate in both. All right, Terrence, I have a question, follow on to that then. Let's so, go, <laughs> let's go. I mean, I gotta make sure I say it right. So um, if a solicitation came out as a WASB, but I'm an Ed WASB, <laughs> and I apply or, you know, submit, is there, is it looked at differently or does it matter at that point it's looked at equally? It's just- It looks at equally okay. because it was, it was specifically set aside for a wise, but that just means there's more people that, that are able to compete. Right. Now, would that, could that give you a competitive advantage? I'm not a CEO, so I wouldn't be able to answer that honestly, mm -hmm. uh, but I wouldn't believe so um, I believe they were looked at as, as as what you do as far as your capability statement, different things of that nature. Are you able to do the job or not, right? So one, t I use the example as um, getting certified as a WASB or Ed WASB is a ticket to the ball game, right? Now, when you get in the ball game is different, right? But that's just to get you a ticket to, to operate in that arena. Once you get in that arena, it's up to you now based upon your capability statement, different things of that nature, on whether you're going to obtain that contract. I just want to be able to get you the ticket to get into the ball game. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I follow on to that one. I am a contracting officer. <laughs> I'm a warranted contracting officer as a director with the unlimited warrant. And so it's not about a competitive advantage per se. Um, the competitive advantage um, it really does speak to your experience and how well you're able to demonstrate your capabilities in your solicitation. Where you're looking for is if the solicitation is set aside for a specific program. So if it's set aside for just women-owned small businesses, there's no ex ex uh, extra competitive advantage for being an economically disadvantaged. Where it comes to play is if you win that contract, we're thinking how can we meet our small business goals? Because every agency has small business goals. So oftentimes when we're putting those requests for information out, we want to know what your cert what kind of, uh, how your business is certified. Because if we have enough of you that are economically disadvantaged, maybe we're not going to do women owned. Maybe we're going to go economically disadvantaged. Maybe we're looking for hub zones. Government struggles getting hub zone um, contracting. Um, to meet those goals every year. So we're looking for hub zones. We're looking for different makeups. We typically buy a certain way in the beginning of the year. And then towards the end of the year, you start seeing a shift. And then when we get closer to September, we're looking for sole source opportunities because we're running out of time because September 30th is that cutoff date. So you're going to want to make sure that you have all of that information available. So it's not necessarily a competitive advantage when bidding on that solicitation, but you want to make sure that that government partner that you're when you're bidding on a solicitation knows the makeup of your company because may, just because you didn't win that one contract doesn't mean we're not going to be looking for your name on something else, especially when we're getting later in the year when we have an opportunity to sole source some stuff because, hey, your, your qualifications were pretty good. You bid pretty good on this one. You may not have won this one because your price was too high or maybe something was off, but we're going to give you that, that debrief and tell you what you did good and what you didn't do so great. And we're going to look at you later. And we want to make sure that you're doing that. And also make sure you're asking for debriefs when they're available. Not every time they're going to be available, but ask for those debriefs. It is simply information gathering. Some contracting officers are scared of debriefs because they think you're going to automatically protest them. That's not what they're used for. <laughs> debriefs are a tool for you to learn what you did right and learn where there's opportunities to do better. Sometimes you're going to think, I should have won that. You know, my price wasn't that much different. How was the solicitation written? You really pay attention to the words in, in those section L and M. Look for what they were looking for, but take advantage of those debrief opportunities to really learn what you were doing good so you can continue to grow those skills and find out what opportunities you had to do something a little bit better. So hope that gives a little bit more insight to that question as well. 
Thank you. <laughs> so um, let's see. For Terrence and Kiana, what keeps you up at night? Um, I think for me is is oh, like I said, I spent 22 years in the United States Army, so retired. For me, is not being able to help the people that I serve, uh, which is my customers right now, um, is the women on small business, and and it does get frustrating when um, I have customers that are not satisfied. I'm not going to be able to. Um, make everyone happy and give you the right answer. Here's what I, I promise you um, from myself and my team. Um, we're going to provide you with the honest truth about your application. I'm going to tell you if you did something wrong, and I'm going to tell you if we did something wrong. Either way, I'm still going to tell you how we're going to fix it. You may not like how we're going to fix it, right? But I'm going to tell you how we're going to fix it. And I will always be an advocate um, for the women on small business that are submitting an application through this program. That I promise you. So those are the things that keep me up at night is not being able to help. When I get calls, um, and you may believe it or not, but if I get called 9, 10 o'clock at night of someone needing help, or Terrence, can you help me? What's the status of my application? I'm getting frustrated. Those things are what, what keep me up at night because those are the people are really trying, uh, they really want help. Uh, and, and it's my job and my team's job to help them as much as we possibly can. <clears throat> I think mine is similar as far as um, really wanting to help. I, I think mine is a little different. Um, I, I'm new to GSA. I got here in 2019, um, as I stated, and I'm, I'm coming from the outside world into a, a very strong culture. So what keeps me up at night is making sure that myself and my team are able to execute the mission of, of serving the businesses and, and our and tenants, um, but also really making us um, kind of that premier Right, I want to create a partnership that's not been in existence in a long time. Right, we we have we've created over time um, an adversarial partnership with our businesses. Um, the government, you know, some businesses don't want to do business with the government because of that. And I want to change that. And so what keeps me up at night is really building those relationships. How can I partner with you? You know, we, we talk about being business advisors and creating partnerships and collaborating. That's really what keeps me up at night is how can I do my job even better the next day? How can I train my staff and give my, my staff the tools that they need to be better the next day? Um, so really with creating that foundation and that partnership and changing the culture around us um, to create you know, that less adversarial relationship. Because let's be honest, when, you're being, when your last payment is being withheld because um, the government has said that you didn't do something, you're like, I, I thought I did everything right, right? that gets stressful to businesses. Um, it's not about us going, well, you did it wrong and you, you should just get it done. It's really about merging together, partnering with each other, figuring out what, how to get to the solution. Our job is to pay you. We want, we want to pay you. We hire you for a job. Let's let you do it. And, and the other thing I would say is, um, the other thing that keeps me up at night is um, trust. The government has to do a better job of trusting the businesses to do the jobs that they do. We spend too much time micromanaging businesses and within our, our contracts to, stay, to say, go ahead, do a job, but do it like this. I, I want to get out of that business. I want to teach my people to get out of that business. Um, it's important to me. It's been my foundation since I started in this field, uh, 2006. And so... Um, I'm still young in, overall in the field, but I, it's important for me to, to see that trend and of really learning, you know, te teaching the workforce, the next level, the millennials of the world, like myself, to really bringing that culture into the government. Because um, let's just be honest, that, that's not always been the culture. And we really want to create that going forward because people like me are going to be the, futures, the leaders of the future. And I want to bring up the next level of future uh, leaders to have that same mindset so we can really change the view of the government, how we do contracting and how we provide our goods and services to the world and creating that partnership and collaboration. Oh, I commend you, Kiana, on that because so we're a manufacturer and uh, we're, we're trying to get more 
um, of the KO or just like the specialist to come in and see our process of what we do because they see it as a flat number, just it's this and we'll dive into well, what justifies the numbers, but there's still, it doesn't click sometimes. So whatever, however we can help you. And again, A was, I, I keep plugging A was A, but I just think from an industry perspective and, and then what, you know, there's gotta be this way we're merging and helping each other more. I would say find ways to utilize your technology to do that. Because mm -hmm. now in the environment we in with, with COVID not being able to connect, oftentimes the reason you, your specialists and your COs don't get to come see what you do is we don't have a travel budget, right? The government's budget's getting cut every year we're trying to do less do more with less you know we always talk about can we can you do a little another discount on that contract you know yeah. we should, we're always asking 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 because let's just be real we are you know our if and i can speak to pbs my buildings are so old and and many of them need so much more and we don't even have access to our full budget and we're fighting congress every day to have access to that so i definitely i would definitely think that um find ways of presenting that to utilizing your technology videos walkthroughs things of that nature creating that uh, opportunity out there when you're doing your capabilities to be able to give them more insight to that because we don't see it oftentimes we don't get it because we many of us have never left that desk in that computer doing that contract you know we only know from that seat and i know you know i, I was the one who was volunteering to get out there you know, to see stuff. And as I saw stuff, I learned stuff. And I was like, oh, I got a different perspective. Well, how do you do that? Oh, okay, great. So it's, it's important. And, and I think with the new environment and the use of technology, there's a lot more opportunities to do it, um, even in, in make it more cost effective, so that it's out there, you know, create partnerships, create capabilities, partner with your small business office to say, hey, we have these capabilities, but we really want to target the contract workforce to show them what we do. Can, is there a way for you to set that up? Our off, small business offices are awesome about setting those up and getting the right people to the table so that not only the contracting folks see it, but those program managers and those end users get to see what it is you do so that they're not, so because they're not challenging it so much in the evaluation because it's not just the COs and CSs, it's really those evaluators who are actually in the field who have to understand it so that when they see it, they're, they're understanding the ability to to, to why the makeup of the pricing is because otherwise we just keep having those same questions over and over i'd love for someone to be like here's why <laughs> go watch this video <laughs> here's the here's a three minute video on the highlights of what you need to know you know you know so there i think there's opportunities there it has been such a pleasure having everybody here today we learned so much from across many continents across many different agencies, across many different skill sets. Um, we as AUSA leaders always try and promote our role within as sort of an ombudsman between, between the military and the contractor community. I always tell people that contractors are sort of like the fifth leg of the army because you have the active reserve guard army civilians and then the contractors because the army couldn't do it without the contractors out there. But, this has been a great pleasure. I want to extend our, a message from us. If you guys need any help from, from GSA or the Small Business Administration, count on us. We, we, got, we have people out in chapters all over the country, even overseas, uh, Europe, Africa, uh, Middle East, Asia. Uh, we can reach people out there if, if you need to speak with people. And we're here. Any, anybody have any closing remarks before we go, before we move on? Yeah, Rosie. All righty. Well, I just wanted to let you know that it has been a pleasure for Rosie Paulson Enterprises to hold the um, summit here in my office. And if you ever need to reach out Hispanics or reach out business owners, I am in the heart of tenant country in Tampa, but this is a, a business resource center. The whole goal of this center is to help business owners stay in business because we want to make sure that they succeed. 70% of the economy of the United States is run by small businesses. So it is in our best interest as Americans to make sure that they stay in business. So Terrence and Kiana, if you ever need this place, just give me a call. I would love to host you guys um, so we can educate the community and make sure we get them equipped, empowered, and to succeed.
Thank you. I have an office down in Tampa, so I might have to come visit you when next time I'm so, down visiting my uh, team. Is Cindy Pritchett? Can you you guys hear? Is Cindy? I'm looking for Cindy Pritchett to tell us about. Cindy is the is our vice president of NCO and Soldiers Affairs. She's a retired command sergeant major, and she's also one of the local directors for the Army Women's Foundation. She will tell us about a scholarship award ceremony that the Army's Army Women's Foundation has later on today. Cindy? All right, thanks, Eric. Uh, and uh, first of all, to everybody that was pre presenting today, that was really great there, information. Uh, I don't think they have my video. Uh, you might come back to us. I'm a, can you hear me? Okay, well. Um, we, we can hear her, Eric. If she comes back to us, Eric, she'll come back to us. But, um, yeah. We can hear her. Oh, you can't? Okay, I can't hear her. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't think you have my video because I came in as a guest. So um, first of all, thanks uh, everybody for the great presentation. And there I think is my video. There yeah, we go. Yeah, I had to enable you. <laughs> okay, so uh, as Eric said, I'm, uh, I'm the vice president of the Army Women's Foundation. We're a 5013C a nonprofit. And our goal of our foundation is to promote um, the history of Army women and to advocate for those presently serving. Uh, as part of that, we have, um, we have a number of programs, but our two, our big program is uh, our annual scholarship award program and then uh, our Hall of Fame induction program. So that is getting ready to take place this afternoon at 2 p.m. Uh, we'll uh, award over 80,000 scholarships to the children of Army women and to Army women and Army women veterans that are currently going to school, both in community college, four-year college, or pursuing a master's or PhD. So um, Eric offered me this opportunity to tell you that if you go to our website at www.awfdn.org, you'll see a link that will at two o'clock go live and bring the uh, scholarship awards and the actual Hall of Fame induction of uh, the seven recipients today at 2 p.m. Uh, and I'm glad that we have this little partnership with uh, AUSA and um, look forward to uh, hopefully having some of you tune in to learn about the, the seven women that we're inducting into the, the Hall of Fame to include the women of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. And then we also award um, two special recognitions awards. These are people that don't necessarily qualify for the Hall of Fame, but through uh, their work or advocacy or um, uh, uh, interest in Army women have done documentaries, et cetera. And then we take an opportunity to, to recognize those through our special recognition award for promoting um, Army women and their history and telling their story. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. And thanks Eric for this opportunity. And I hope that folks will take the opportunity to turn in, tune in at 2 p.m to our uh, ceremony. Thanks again. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, as we close out, I've got a couple of announcements. First off, this was really fun. It was a great pleasure. I hope we can do it again next year. I hope, uh, you know, we'll send out some follow-on information, some slides and things like this, points of contact. I posted the uh, contact details for the PTAC the local PTAC, that's the Procurement Technical Assistance Center for, for Tampa, if anybody wants to get support there. Uh, here's a very important announcement. On the 24th of March, we have the Southeastern Army Medical Symposium. And that is with Army Reserve Medical Command. And we're gonna talk about medical operations past, present, past and present during pandemics and other challenges. So there'll be a heavy focus on the on the current COVID response. Who is we? The role. I'm sorry? Who is we? Oh, <laughs> go ahead, Cindy, tell. No, that's okay. It's just that is the next webinar for the Pivot to Excellence uh, series um, because it wasn't clear who the we was that was presenting the uh, symposium, but you go ahead, you've got all the details. That's the, next, that's the next segment of the Pivot to Excellence, of our Pivot to Excellence series because this is an important thing in St. Petersburg, we have Army Reserve Medical Command, and this is something that we established to support, support them. Uh, and we, we're gonna have amazing speakers. We have General uh, Brigadier General Bagby, um, George Wunderlich from the Army Reserve 
Army, Army Medical Command History Center. It's going to be great. Then on the 25th of April, we have following leg. That will be the uh, Israeli American Military History Symposium. We're going to talk about the history of the Yom Kippur War and have a lot of Israeli uh, retired Israeli generals speak about what their experience was during the Yom Kippur War. Um, and then later on in May, we'll have the second leg of that, of that symposium and then a FEMA symposium. So those are just some upcoming events. I hope the, that you'll join us for it. And uh, it's been a pleasure and thanks for joining us. Thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts, your expertise, your knowledge, your, your time. And uh, we're very proud to have you all as part of the Pivot to Excellence um, Executive Symposia and Summit Series. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. All right, thank you.